Good morning, everybody. Bonjour à tous. My name is Vincent Gabaglio from uh, UMedSat. I'm happy to welcome you for this first uh, webinar uh, on Earth observation in Africa in 2022. And uh, we were happy to welcome you with a short historical video of UMedSat. And uh, today we will uh, be sharing with you a few information about our activities on Africa, and especially on no-casting. Before giving the floor to uh, the two uh, introductory uh, speakers for their, in, for, for their uh, introductory words, I would like just to inform you that interpretation from English to French is available. So you can choose your language uh, on the bottom right button. It's like a world map. If you click on it, you can choose either to listen in French or in English. And uh, that's the first point. Uh, the second point, I would like also to inform you that you can use the Q&A, the polls, or the chat. We will have a few polls that uh, during this uh, webinar. Use the chat to communicate among yourself as you want. And after the presentation of the Q&A sessions, uh, you will uh, use uh, the Q&A uh, to raise uh, your questions. For um, your information also, all the presentation that will be displayed today will be available uh, for download uh, directly on the same page where you did a registration. And we will also have a survey at the end of the webinar to get your feedback on uh, the various uh, sessions and presentation and your uh, opinion uh, that will help us also for the forthcoming webinar. Without further ado, I would like to give now the floor to Phil Evans, UMEDSA Director General, for his introductory words. Phil, the floor is yours. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, it's uh, uh, an absolute pleasure to welcome you to this EO African webinar, which I believe is the, um, do you believe is the first one of 2022. Um, this year is a really important year for UMETSAT. It's the year that we are preparing uh, for the first launch of the next generation MTG satellite with planned launch in the middle of December. Um, this mission, as well as ensuring continuity with previous missions, will also dramatically enhance um, space-based observations over Africa with higher resolution, more frequent data. Uh, this, this presents great opportunities for the community in Africa to enhance its services generally. But this webinar is focusing on one particular um, area of application for geostationary satellites, such as MTG, and that's now casting. As you'll see from the uh, examples that will be discussed later in the seminar, um, now casting can be a key tool for disaster risk reduction as well as providing critical information that's relevant to other sectors such as um, aviation and energy. And, and in a really positive trend, we've seen um, a significant improvement in uh, the use of satellite data to support now casting services uh, in several African countries recently this year. And notice, notably, this has been uh, as a consequence of the Africa SWIFT project led by Leeds University, and the implementation of now casting SAF software in various countries. So it's clear that the launch of MTG presents a real opportunity to improve services that will have a positive impact on society. Uh, but these opportunities won't be realized with, without addressing uh, certain challenges. Uh, and some of these challenges will be addressing um, in the 15th UMETSAT User Forum in Tanzania later this year, where we will be uh, working with users and hopefully able to better support them in managing the transition to MTG. Now, I look forward to meeting some of you um, at this user forum. Uh, and as for today, I just wish you all uh, a very productive uh, and interesting webinar, which I'm sure it will be. So thank you very much. 
Thank you, Phil. Merci beaucoup, Phil. Euh, je voudrais maintenant euh, passer la parole à Doug Parker de l'Université de Leeds. Comme vous avez pu le noter euh, dans la présentation, ce webinaire est co-organisé avec le projet Swift Africa, qui est un projet financé par euh, le Royaume-Uni et qui a permis euh, des avancées significatives en termes de prévision euh, en temps réel euh, en Afrique. Doug, euh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Vincent. Uh, so first, uh, let me thank thank you, Vincent, and Yumetsat for the invitation to uh, co-organize and, and present this webinar. Uh, I'm just going to share one uh, slide, if you allow me to do that by way of introduction. Uh, okay, so you can see the slide. Uh, so if you could just move to the next slide, I would just give you a few words of, of background to my, my own history in uh, now casting in Africa. So um, I, with Marianne Diopcan, over a number of years, following the AMA project, uh, we put together this book. It's an edited book with a number of chapters on uh, weather forecasting in West Africa. I think it's unique, this book. It has been translated into French. There is a French version. Um, when we wrote this book, we discovered many areas of forecasting for Africa where there are gaps. Uh, and one of the real gaps was in now casting. Uh, we know that now casting saves lives and saves property. It's economically important and it's important for humanitarian reasons. Uh, but in West Africa in particular, we found there was very little now casting being done and now casting was not well understood. Uh, so the chapter was prepared and there is a chapter on now casting in this book and it's a good document, it's a useful document. Uh, but when you read this, you will see that the examples and the methods are taken from other parts of the world. So there are examples from South America. Uh, there are also examples from field campaigns. Uh, but there is very little in terms of operational examples from Africa, because now casting really uh, was hardly, hardly existed in West Africa at that time. So now um, I think everything has changed. Um, and the opportunities have been transformed. So firstly, we have been able to learn from the South African Weather Service, uh, who have been doing effective now casting for a number of years and supporting the region. There are a few radars. So one thing that has held back now casting over the years has been the lack of radars in Africa, but now there are some radars. Um, so where they exist, they are the best tool. But I think most importantly is that in the SWIFT project and the highway project, we have been able to use the satellite now casting solutions, which have been available, in fact, for more than a decade. So we see now that a number of African centers are using now casting operationally, uh, and we uh, have some guidance and standard operating procedures to help this. And really, there is no barrier now to now casting uh, in Africa. Uh, all that is needed is the investment and the effort in capacity building and training uh, to implement this. Um, we can also do more research to improve the quality of the product, but really the products are available now. So I'm very happy that we have this webinar now. It's very timely. Um, as the SWIFT project is ending, um, to be talking about now casting across the whole continent. So I look forward to the webinar. And again, I thank you for, to UMETSAT for inviting us to, to do this joint event. Thank you, Doug. Merci beaucoup. And uh, I think this presentation set well the scene. And uh, you will see during this webinar a lot of uh, applications of uh, this no casting, satellite based no casting for most of them in various uh, areas and corners of Africa. But we will start uh, this webinar also with a presentation from the African uh, Center for uh, Meteorological Application from Development, ACMAD. And I'm pleased to welcome André Kamga, his Director General, for an introductory uh, keynote presentation on the benefits of no casting uh, in Africa. So, André, the floor is yours, and thanks to uh, Phil and Doug for their introductory remarks. André, I'll let you share your presentation, and you can start either in French or in English as you prefer. Merci. Merci. Good morning, everyone. 
So can you see this, the slide? Not in, in a full view. We can see the slide, but not in a full screen. Ah, okay. No, it's okay. Good. So uh, these few slides will uh, will help us see uh, some of the benefits that uh, we have on uh, the use of satellite data for now casting. Uh, so uh, one of the first uh, sector in which uh, we work actually with SWIFT uh, to, to expand uh, on is the, the use uh, of dust information in meningitis surveillance and control in Africa. Uh, secondly, uh, ACMAD now has uh, an infrastructure uh, to act as a continental multi-hazard advisory center. Uh, so some of these products, including the rapid developing thunderstorms are part of, uh, of the process leading to advisories, watches, and support to countries to issue warnings. Uh, so the, the policy that we apply in this regard is that at the continental level, we issue advisories uh, up to four or five days ahead, and then watch this uh, one to two days ahead, and then work with the country uh, to, to issue warning. And it is on this warning aspect that uh, non-casting is very much uh, useful. Uh, so we tried this approach this year, particularly with Madagascar, with the, the non-Batsirai cyclone. Uh, then uh, we also use uh, satellite for precipitation monitoring. Uh, so in the, in the products we have, uh, we'll show some examples. And then the monitoring of the start of the season, uh, detecting it uh, and uh, use it as information for our uh, national med services and their users. Uh, so this is just a map of the situation of the Continental Multi-Hazard Advisory Center now operating at, at ACMAD, uh, which basically helped to, to generate uh, this information and disseminate it. So for the meningitis surveillance and control, uh, a few decades ago, there was a, a project, a research project called MERIT, uh, by the World Health Organization to try and understand the connections between climate and meningitis epidemics in the meningitis belt of Africa. And this led to uh, an understanding of the relationships between climate parameters and meningitis. Uh, so at the end of this project, we capitalized on the findings and uh, uh, developed uh, vigilance products that uh, are now uh, being used on a regular basis for surveillance and control, both at the regional level with the multi-disease surveillance center of WSO in Burkina Faso and at the national level by the ministries of health units in charge of surveillance and control of meningitis. Uh, so uh, in generating this product, you basically use uh, dust uh, products derived from, from satellite data. Uh, so this is uh, uh, another slide uh, specifically on, on dust storm monitoring, uh, where uh, from the Puma, the Synergy system, we can locate, as you can see this color here, uh, dust storm over Northwestern Africa. And uh, from the analysis of the WMO, uh, Center for Sun and Dust Storm in Barcelona, also helping to locate this, uh, 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 this dust storm using analysis, model analysis, which actually combine also some satellite data. Uh, now, one of the major rain producing system, uh, heavy rain producing systems across West and Central Africa is the so-called squall line. And uh, we have here uh, the, the squall line seen from the infrared channel of Meteosat. And down here, the same score line seen with the uh, SAF now casting product called, called Rapid Developing Thunderstorms. And uh, uh, one of the advantage of using this is that we can actually see the overshooting top 
uh, in the in the line of uh, MCACs that compose the squall line. And uh, we also have from the RDT process, uh, processing system, uh, a set of products that, uh, or parameters that are generated on the stage of the system, on the rain um, intensity, uh, and many other parameters that help to appreciate the severity of the event. So this is just a second example of uh, the monitoring still with the uh, rapid developing thunderstorm products uh, developed in the SWIFT program. So this product uh, here was uh, it's a collaboration with Meteo France. And this one is a new development that occurred during uh, the, the SWIFT project in which Ahmad was involved. So as indicated uh, for the warning uh, over Madagascar, during this, this uh, cyclone season, uh, we actually use the rapid developing thunderstorm uh, to, to detect uh, the most, the, the heavy rainy areas. Uh, as you can see here with the rapid developing thunderstorm, we can localize heavy rainy areas. And with the infrared channel of Meteosat, it actually uh, described the, the cloudiness, which covered a large area. And with the rapid developing thunderstorm product, we can effectively go local. Uh, the second thing we are we have done is that uh, with the advisories that we issue, we use a poor man's ensemble of a set of global producing centers to actually track, forecast the track of cyclones. And then uh, the satellite data is later used to actually identify exactly the estimates of where the cyclone uh, has been on. And uh, this satellite information is then used to validate or verify the forecast tracks. So in addition to providing information for detection and short-term forecasting, uh, satellite products are extensively useful to, to verify uh, forecast information we may have. Uh, so, uh, we have also a collaboration with the uh, Pennsylvania State University on uh, monitoring, pollution monitoring in some African cities using in, uh, in situ uh, data sets. And we are now uh, looking for uh, new products, maybe in the next generation MTG or next generation of polar orbiting satellite, actually to validate uh, this uh, uh, using uh, validate satellite data using this in situ product and be able to generate at the continental scale pollution information uh, useful uh, for our health systems. Uh, so in addition to meningitis surveillance, this is the other health related products on which uh, we are working. Uh, the last product now is on uh, something very important in our heart, the, the, the agriculture calendar. As you can see here, with, with satellite derived rainfall, we are able to compare the start of the season detected uh, uh, from one year to another. So this is uh, on your left, it is uh, 2020. Uh, so the season actually start around late February, early March in the Gulf of Guinea and move in the Sahel in June, July. As you can see here in red, a uh, satellite derived start of the season, which was basically mostly lit in the Gulf of Guinea, most of the Gulf of Guinea uh, areas. And on, in 2021, for the same period, we have more of uh, early start of the, of the agriculture season. So this shows uh, an additional potential usefulness of satellite data knowing that we have a, 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 a paucity of uh, uh, station uh, precipitation observations across Africa, we can see here that uh, the use of satellite data can be of, uh, of great use uh, across, across the continent. Uh, thank you. So these are the, the little benefits that we collected and wanted to share with you and uh, highlighting the need for uh, actually using satellite data for now casting 
and with applications in different sectors, health, agriculture, disaster risk reduction. Uh, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, André. Merci pour euh, votre présentation et nous avoir euh, montré l'étendue et la variété des, des différentes applications euh, du satellite en, en Afrique. Euh, je voudrais signaler à l'audience que nous venons d'ouvrir le premier euh, questionnaire euh, sous euh, Paul Sinning en anglais. Euh, so je vous invite à répondre à cette première question. Si vous avez des questions sur les présentations, vous pouvez aussi utiliser le bouton « questions et euh, réponses » Q&A euh, et poster vos questions euh, sous, cette, euh, sous ce, cette, cette, cette utilité, facilité de, de, de Zoom. Without further ado, now I would like to pass the floor to the next speaker, which is Veza Nietzsche-Svara from UMedSat for an introduction uh, on uh, how satellites support the no casting. So digging a bit more uh, inside what André uh, presented, but uh, seen from, from a satellite perspective. So Veza, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vincent, uh, and uh, good morning to everybody. Yes, uh, I was very happy to see Andre's presentation about the satellite, uh, uh, satellite uh, support already. And I continue from this topic a bit. Uh, and I know that during the morning, there will be much more nice cases that you can see the benefits of the satellite support now casting. Uh, in my talk, I just wanted to briefly uh, uh, summarize the, what, what's the importance of the satellite observations in for making nowcasts. They are the backbone for the nowcasting. As we know, uh, without the observations, the nowcasting is, uh, well, it's very, very challenging. Yet without knowing the current status, you are in darkness. In Africa, especially, there's a great variety of observation density, and it, that depends on the regional capacity. So we have, uh, if we think about the different sources of information that we need for nowcasting, I have marked here in this list uh, with, with the red colors, those that are quite challenging in many parts of uh, Africa. Um, we know that there are uh, increasing capabilities in radar networks, and that's, of course, promising. Keeping up the radar networks is, however, quite, quite a big task, it's expensive, and it requires a continuous maintenance. For the satellite part, we might say that the satellite observations they hugely mitigate this imbalance between different regions, giving an equal opportunity for the users and forecasts in the different parts of this continent to, to use the observations and see the current state of the atmosphere well. Together with the uh, numerical weather prediction models, I believe that the satellite uh, information is the most important to, uh, uh, for the forecasters to, to provide the nowcasts. And we can say, and we can see that these uh, observational capabilities are now in, in very much improving in the upcoming years as we uh, head towards the new satellite generations with ever increasing uh, information and coverage and both in spectral timely and spatial resolution and also offering more tools for us to, to develop no, more now casting services in Africa. I'm taking one example here. I already saw Andre was using one of some of the convection examples and as we know, convection is one of the most important uh, now casting topics in all over the world. Not the only one, naturally. We have also fog and stratus, uh, dust, many other events that, are, that require now casting. But I'm taking the now casting convection as an example here. We, we know that uh, traditionally we classify now the convection in three stages where you have the pre-convection state, then you have the initiation of the convection, and finally the mature stages of convection. And if we think about the uh, satellite role, the satellites have a role in all of these. Even for the pre-convecting environment, we can have the product supporting our, our understanding where the instable areas, where the moist areas are. In, in, the, in the moments of the convective initiation, the, the value of the satellites is particularly important. There's often signals in the satellite information that show you where the development is now going to take place, even before there's any sign in let's say a radar imagery. And that helps you to lead some time, to win some time. 
Natural convection is then another topic where you can use different uh, algorithms to, uh, to track and follow the development. In, in this respect, I'm just uh, using one very, very simple example here. There will be much nicer examples later on this, this morning. But this is just a one uh, imaginary example of uh, a usual morning in central parts of Africa where you see the model output for the convection. The model output is, of course, it's a global model, but with a quite fine resolution. And you can see that there's a certain convective type of uh, um, pattern that you can see in this morning feature. And then if you wear a local uh, or regional forecast that you, you should um, make a now cast for these two locations in the map, Kindu and Wufe, um, what would you be able to do? Without the, without the satellite information, you would be trusting the rather sparse obs surface observation network and the models. But once you add the satellite information and in the very simple convection RGB image, you start seeing the big picture and uh, all the gaps and in the inform in information are very well filled. And you see that actually, yes, there are developing thunderstorms near the both uh, airfields. In this example, what would you do if, if you would be required to make an outcast up to two, three hours ahead and it, it's an early morning, you would of course then have a look on the animation and you immediately as a forecaster get an un understanding of what place is uh, probably having some problems. So you see these easter easterly and northerly movements of the different convection areas and you see the yellow areas indicating rapid development. And uh, this is something that every forecaster needs to use at their work when they do now casting, even without any advanced uh, modern now casting systems. And finally, uh, as we summarize, we can see that what really happens uh, while you look at this movie, you can also uh, think about that uh, indeed in the data sparse regions, uh, satellite imagery, even if it, even it's very basic product are quite useful for now casting purposes. They are essential for providing operational now casting services and uh, geostationary satellites, they provide in Africa an excellent spatial and temporal coverage. We can use them for storm tracking, rainfall estimates, instability indices, basically everything that you need to make a good, uh, good now casting for convection and also extrapolated now casts. Now what we see here and what we have been uh, demonstrating in this example is of course a very traditional way of looking at the now casting where you manually extrapolate uh, the forecast. But as we have already seen, there are products that help you to actually use now casting systems to assist your now casting, for example, the now casting subsystems. What comes to the timeliness, now casting especially is highly dependent on the rapidity of updating information. With six hour old information, you don't do much for your forecast, for your now cost. So the information has to be up to date and it has to come frequently and it has to be updated frequently. And in the real time observations are critical where you can think about weather radars every five to 10 minutes nowadays, MSG satellite every 15 minutes, MTG will be every 10 minutes, lighting detection systems, as a matter of fact, they are in a matter of seconds. These type of frequencies are needed to make better, better now casts. And all in all, stable communication links are crucial. You don't, uh, you, you need to have the data coming in reliably. And I'm just pointing to the UMAT cast system as a, as a means of providing the information with a very stable and reliable communication link. Finally, the current and upcoming capabilities, the development now casting applications is really evolving rapidly, uh, as we heard from Douglas. Uh, the expanding Earth observation observational capacity is increasing. We have new satellite instruments and new measurement techniques coming in. For example, the lightning instrument, we are uh, expecting great improvements in, uh, in, in the capabilities through that instrument. We also have increased possibilities for advanced and massive data uh, processing. Also the artificial intelligence machine learning techniques are bringing in new horizons and new uh, 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 possibilities for, for making better now casts. And all in all, 
by improving the understanding of the atmospheric phenomena, the forecasters will be able to also improve uh, their now costs. And finally, I can say that it's vital for the user community, community in Africa, in everywhere, to be active partner in this development. And with this, I thank you for your attention, and I give the floor back to Vincent. Thank you, Veza. Merci, Veza. Thanks for this uh, nice introductory presentation to the use of satellites for no casting and uh, the importance of uh, real-time data access to the various observations for the forecasters. Uh, I've seen also that we have already two uh, questions raised in the Q&A. We will take a bit of time after the next presentation to go through the Q&A and uh, before also that we start with the presentation of the four user cases in Africa. But before going to the user case, I would like now to pass the floor to John Marsham from the University of Leeds, who will uh, speak uh, to us a bit more on the capacity building that has been done through the SWIFT project for Africa. So uh, John, the floor is yours. If there you could stop sharing your presentation and John, you can take the floor. Thank you. Okay, thank you, and thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, I'll just share my screen and put it onto full screen mode, and then I will start. Okay, yes, yeah, so thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm John Marsham from University of Leeds, and I was one of the people leading now casting within the GCRF Africa SWIFT project. Um, before I talk about the Nile casting, I thought I'd just say a very little bit about SWIFT. Doug Parker will speak more about SWIFT later. So SWIFT was a large project with um, partnerships between forecasting centres and universities aiming to improve weather prediction and build capacity. Um, and that was for forecasting across timescales from now casting all the way up to sub-seasonal and seasonal. But today we'll just be talking about the now casting component. And it, these university academic partnerships were present in um, Senegal, Ghana, Nigeria, and Kenya, alongside other partners such as ACMAD. Um, also, just talk about what now casting is, as this can often cause confusion. Um, some of the other speakers have said a bit about this. So I think as the last speaker said, now cast analysis of near real-time observations to define the current weather is, is an absolutely critical component of now casting. And then taking that forward into four projections um, based on observed weather features, so not simply from numerical models, but extrapolation of observed weather um, to forecast future weather. And as the last speaker said, that requires continued monitoring of data made possible by rapid workflow and data acquisition. Typically, we normally use now casting for high impact weather, um, often convection, as we've seen, but also things like fog and atmospheric dust, which can have high impact, and tends to focus on the stakeholders who are vulnerable to those events. So it's very much a, you know, a user-led applied activity. Aviation's historically one of the biggest users, but there's other, or well, many other users um, that it could be used for and is useful. I think it's also important to point out, I think it's not really strictly defined by timescale, more by the process. So now casting is dependent on this forward extrapola ob extrapolation of observations and how long you can do that for it depends on, on the weather and the type of systems you're experiencing. And it's facilitated by computer systems that bring together the different data sets. And then that is um, examined by the forecasters. So there's a really important human element here. Um, the forecast to interpretation. So at the start of SWIFT, um, we did a, a survey of the status of now casting products in sub-Saharan Africa. This, I'm sure this is not complete and I would be very interested to learn from people for anything that we've missed. But what we found in that was we couldn't find any use of automated now cast products or automated forward extrapolations in sub-Saharan Africa outside of South Africa. And outside of South Africa, now casting was limited to use of satellite imagery and surface observations, mainly at major international airports. 
And of course, in much of Africa, convective storms generate high impact weather, and that is an ideal problem for now casting. And in addition, numerical weather prediction often has very low skill. Um, there's this paper here by Vogel et al, which shows that NWP is often struggling to beat climatology or persistence. And as the last speaker pointed out, Africa has excellent coverage from Meteosat, um, and that provides enormous potential for satellite-based now casting. Um, even though we don't have radars, we have um, very good coverage from geostationary satellite. And that really informed the SWIFT approach, which was to focus on convective storms, um, apply and evaluate the NWC staff products that previous speakers have mentioned, work to generate those in Africa and in the UK, um, sharing them online, and then research to improve and develop products and understand storm behaviour to inform now casting. So that was rather theoretical, but this is just one real world example. So the three coloured images um, here, these are forward extrapolations of rainfall of a large MCS affecting Senegal. And these are for, forward extrapolated for 1.5 hours. And the pink line shows where the storm was in reality. So we can see a really accurate now cast um, of how far this storm had moved because the pink line lines up with the rainfall retrieval. Um, so we're getting very clear skill from these products at 1.5 hours for this case. And this, this system was high impact, it caused major flooding. And within SWIFT, we've developed this website shown there, which allows the viewer to view animations of products such as this and forward extrapolations alongside the kind of false color imagery um, shown on the right here and that the last speaker spoke about. To look at that more statistically, we've, we've analysed skill across many, many storms. Um, you won't have time to digest the details of the graphs here, but the, there's some really important messages. First is um, that the NWC staff products have skill for their rain rate retrievals. Um, so that's shown in the top right graph. If you benchmark that against high quality um, non-geostationary satellite data, there's the skill in those rainfall retrievals. The forward extrapolations have skill to at least 1.5 hours. And also the RDT product, um, the rapidly developing thunderstorm product, also has skill for growth and decay. We've got more work ongoing on um, evaluation. So this is some work being done at Knest in Ghana, evaluating the NWC SAF rain rates against the DACUA rain gauge network. And again, we're seeing significant skill, particularly once you look at something like a three hour accumulation. And then uh, Ralph Burton's paper this year actually showed that the skill can extend to at least four hours once you start to look at scales of around 150 kilometers, 180 kilometers. So now casting has skill over many hours um, and particularly in the evening and night when we have a large and mature systems. The other elements of SWIFT, we're looking at new products. So the top left shows ongoing work to do a new rainfall retrieval. As the last speaker said, um, artificial intelligence and machine learning allow lots of opportunities here. So this is a random forest approach um, to try and improve the rain retrievals from the satellite data. And then in the bottom right, this is new sources of information. So this isn't just using the visible and infrared images of the clouds. This was a paper from Chris Taylor published this year, sharing how satellite observed land surface temperature anomalies can be used to inform now casting because these large storms tend to follow areas of high land surface temperatures. We've also been working with projects um, which are taking new approaches, in particular the NFLIX project. I don't have time to say much about this, but this is, is taking a, a statistical approach to now casting, essentially saying, if given where the storms are now, um, given very many statistics of past storms, where do we expect those to be in the future? Um, and then they're integrating the land surface temperature into those statistical calculations. And the test beds that Doparka will speak about later highlighted um, the benefit of having both the NFLIX products and the NWC SAF products. Um, part of SWIFT was building capability 
um, in the UK and Africa. So in the UK, we'd set up a system to receive the satellite data and generate the NWC SAF products. And within SWIFT, KNUST, Ghana Met, NIMET and ACMAD have all done the same and that's running locally and set up is, is ongoing in Senegal and Kenya. I think this is a really good example of how universities and national MET centres can support each other. Um, very often one of that pair set this up first and then made a visit to the other institution to support setup. Um, we have guidance documents to, to facilitate that setup. Um, and those centres are now using locally generated op products operationally, as well as using the, the NCAS website where the products are being put online in real time. And it's also, um, it's really exciting to see these products being used in training and teaching as well, um, including in countries which are not members of SWIFT, such as Rwanda. The test beds, Doug Park will say much more about later, but these were um, bringing together forecasting researchers to, to forecast in real time, day by day and hour by hour. And for me, it was just really reinforced the value of hands-on activity for now casting. It's, you can do the science, but you need to apply it in practice to, to understand it. Um, and various lessons there about the importance of synoptic information, the value of different data sources. Um, the opportunities for now casting in, this, in the phase of convective initiation, which again, one of the speakers spoke about. Um, the importance of having easy to use platforms. Um, we generated some standard operating procedures, SOPs that we refined through our test beds. And again, Doug will speak about those later. And finally, the importance of user feedback. So um, by sharing these now cast with, with users, getting feedback on how useful they are and how they can be improved. And something that came out of that were also various state case studies. So this is a case study that's being analyzed in KNUST, um, some flooding event in Ghana, again, using the Dakuwa rain gauges. And it's, it's by looking at cases that we can understand the success and failures of the automated products, but also improve our understanding of the storm behavior and support forecaster decision-making using these products. Another um, outcome of SWIFT is this development of this faster app forecasting African storms application. So this is an app for a phone um, which displays now casting products available from the Google Play Store using the convective rain rates and rapidly developing thunderstorm products currently. So we're doing this working with national MET centres. So it's, it's absolutely critical we don't undercut the MET centres in provision of forecast information. So Currently, we're initially working with Kenya Met, and this is only available within Kenya um, as a free service to the general public. Um, but obviously, now this app is developed, there's potential to expand that across other countries working with those national Met centers. Um, so my conclusions, so we have large long-lived storms in Africa combined with very poor numerical weather prediction. That's essentially due to the inherent difficulties of forecasting weather in the tropics and also a limited observational network. And as many other speakers have said, Metisat provides a huge opportunity for now casting. Um, and we're going to need satellite now casting for many years, even if radars are established for major population centers. And the third generation lightning observations will benefit African now casting, but that also introduces challenges in terms of the volumes of data that that new generation of satellite platform will bring. I think SWIFT has only scratched the surface. As far as we're aware, it's the first sub-Saharan African now casting setups in use outside South Africa. I'm happy to be corrected if I'm wrong. Um, it's really shown the value of university partnerships with national MET centers. It's demonstrated the skill of the products, um, but also their usefulness to decisions. We have two new platforms of delivery listed there, and we have these standard operating procedures and documentation for those and for setup. But I think there's, you know, there's enormous scope for future improvement now. Um, we can rapidly deploy some of new research into operational systems, and there's opportunities for new research and expansion to, to other um, applications such as fog and lightning. I'm not sure why my 
conclusions are not advancing. My final point really is a, is a, is a personal learning. Obviously, I'm a, largely a researcher. I've done um, work with operational centers over the years. And I think for me, one thing I learned from Swift was that taking research through to operations is about much more than just developing and evaluating these tools and providing evidence of their value and building capacity for their use. It's also, we need to actually enable the Met centers to have the staff time to use these tools to bring these forecasts into the real world and benefit real people. And now is really an excellent time for um, not only bringing um, research into operations, but also for, for operations to be feeding back to research and driving the research agenda to improve now casting in ways that support use and impact on the ground. Okay, thank you again um, for the invitation. I'll finish there. Thank you, John. Merci beaucoup pour cette présentation. Et je voulais uh, profiter de cette, de ce, cette petite pause pour vous informer des résultats du premier petit questionnaire. Donc, uh, a lot of you are all fine or great today. I've seen that a few people are still a bit under the weather, so we hope that this webinar on outcasting will help you changing this in the course of the day. So, thank you, John, also for the introduction of the Swiss project, Swift project, and um, we will now go through uh, various four presentations uh, that uh, from uh, Africa uh, that showcase, uh, shows the, some, some concrete user case of the use of satellites for no casting in Africa. I've seen that most, lots of you have used also the Q&A. Uh, we will get back to that after these four presentations. Some of my colleagues have already answered some of the questions, so you can also check on the Q&A about uh, open question and answered question. We also just have activated the chat function. So you will be, if, if you want just to chat and not necessarily to ask question, you can also now use the chat function on Zoom uh, to do so. So I would like first to thank all the three first presenters, André, Veza, and John. And uh, without further ado, I would like now to uh, go to the first user case, which will come from the Indian Ocean for the Mauritius Meteorological Services. As you know, uh, Mauritius, the, the Indian Oceans have been affected by quite strong cyclones this season, especially Madagascar, which was eaten by five, three cyclones and five in total um, uh, storm. And Vimal uh, will tell us a bit more about how they are using no casting uh, in this, uh, during this cyclone season. So Vimal, the floor is yours. Yes, good afternoon, uh, Vincent, and good afternoon, uh, everyone. So I thank uh, you, Metsat, in fact, for giving us the opportunity to present this case study. So just to share my screen. We can see it. Yeah. Just put it on, uh, on the screen. Okay. So I introduce myself. I am uh, Vibal Mangal, meteorologist at the Mauritius Meteorological Services. So I'm presenting today on behalf of Dr. Ram Kumar Damia, who is the deputy director. So unfortunately, he's in a meeting who could not attend this webinar. So this is a Brief outline of the presentation that uh, we, are, we are having, what that we are presenting uh, today. And the focus here is more on the use of uh, satellite product, in fact, to warn the population in Mauritius and also for issuing warnings, which level of warning that uh, is required in order for safety of the population, as well as to reduce infrastructural damage. So this is a list of a brief impact uh, from the cyclone Baxerai, which crossed uh, over the Southwest Indian Ocean, where we had heavy even torrential rain causing flood over the island. We had cyclonic wind also, which exceeded 120 kilometers per hour. In fact, we recorded 155 kilometers per hour as gust during the passage of the cyclone. And since we are an island state surrounded by the sea, so the passage of an intense tropical cyclone like Baxi, in fact, caused coastal inundation, which affected 
in fact, the northern coast. Definitely, uh, such natural disaster is associated with economic losses because after the issuance of warnings, cyclone warnings, so the country were, had a day off on, during the passage of the cyclone. So this is a history of, uh, of a track, a historical track of uh, the cyclone. And uh, if we start from the right-hand side, this is where the cyclone originated, almost in the mid-Indian Ocean. So eventually it adopted a west-southwesterly track and while approaching the, the inhabited islands, that is the Mascarene region where we have the Union, Mauritius, and even Rodrigues. So it passed quite far to the north of Rodrigues Island, but eventually on the 31st of January, it adopted this southwesterly trajectory and passed at around 130 kilometers to the northwest of Mauritius. So that was quite close. And seeing the, intense of the intensity of uh, the cyclone, so the island was severely in, uh, affected by this cyclone. And eventually, as we can see from the track, it even went over South Madagascar. So in order to produce such track, we need satellite images. The satellite images will give us the, the, the position of the system which we are going to, which we use normally to plot and even calculate the distance from inhabited islands. As I said earlier, so the satellite images are very much important because we need to know which weather hazard is going to approach and influence our inhabited islands. And at the same time, which level of cyclone we are going to enforce. So the cyclone warning in Mauritius is categorized in four levels. So starting from class one, then it moved to class two, class three, and class four, which is the maximum alert. Then it is followed by termination, that is when there is no risk of a, a gust exceeding 120 kilometers per hour. So this is the, the use of Meteosat 8 visible channel in fact, uh, uh, during the early stage of Batsirai during its evolution in the Indian Ocean. So on 27th of January, we already identified a mark low pressure that was evolving quite far uh, to the east of the Mascarene region. Then two days ago, we can see that the storm has strengthened and even named at the same time. So we use these satellite images, in fact, to, to track uh, our weather system, which are likely to influence the island. So this is uh, another image, in fact, which is showing that uh, when we started issuing our cyclone warning for Mauritius, so as the cyclone was approaching uh, uh, our island, so on 31st of January, we started with a class one, that is warning the population that there is a cyclone approaching and there are some precautions that should be taken. So we can see from the satellite image that it though it is quite small, so Mauritius is still far from the cyclone. Then, this is when the island was in maximum alert on the 2nd of February. So the cyclone was just almost 200 kilometers to the north of Mauritius. So at that stage, we were already uh, recording gusts of 120 kilometers per hour, and at the same time, we were under the direct influence of the cyclone. The satellite images also help us to determine that the cyclone was intensifying because of developing eye uh, when it was approaching us from the window. Another interesting feature also that we identified uh, from the Indian tropical cyclone Batsirai was the eye wall replacement cycle. And this we uh, identified it using the meteor site 8 infrared image. So on the third, after the cyclone crossed the longitude of Mauritius, so we started seeing a vast area of warm air intruding inside the, near the, the eye of the cyclone. So this was a case of eye wall replacement cyclone. So after the cycle was completed, we can see that the eye became larger. But another thing is that the diameter of the cyclone itself extended. So therefore, 
Though the cyclone has already passed its closest distance from, uh, from the island, but still we were experiencing quite severe weather. So this helped us to determine if whether we are going to maintain the cyclone warning to keep people in shelter. These are water vapor images, in fact, uh, just to, to study, in fact, just to analyze. So in fact, Maxirai uh, was a small core system. And uh, since it was a small core system, you can see that uh, though we had some dry air pockets around uh, the cyclone, but still it was sufficient, in fact, uh, to, for moisture influx. Uh, it was quite autonomous in terms of moisture. So to, to moisture influx toward the storm. So though it was, a, a, the, it was surrounded by uh, uh, dry air, but still it uh, intensified quite rapidly because of its small diameter. This is a microwave uh, satellite image product that uh, was very useful in fact uh, for us. So this is Mauritius by the time Patsirai had already crossed uh, to its nearest point. So we could identify quite active rain band that was still crossing the island. And it even helped us also to determine other cloud band which were associated in the south uh, eastern quadrant of uh, the cyclone that could eventually hit the island. So all these products were very useful in fact in uh, monitoring the cyclone and also at the same time to warn the population. This is a satellite wind uh, data and the satellite wind data also is very important because it helped us to know what the, the gust, I mean the strongest gust uh, which is associated with a storm and at the same time what type of damage we can expect over the island. So like I mentioned also earlier that the island is surrounded by the sea, so the strong wind that is generated by the cyclone also uh, created some, uh, I mean, the storm surge and which affected the island as the cyclone was approaching us. So we had a storm surge of around 0.5 to 1 meters, which affected uh, all the north, northern coast of the island. And these are some uh, uh, figures showing uh, the gas distribution over the island. So the island is, is a com I mean, the topography of the island is quite complex. So that's why you can see that the distribution of the gas is not uniform over the, uh, the whole island. So in some places where we have gas exceeding 100 kilometers per hour, this, these are quite elevated places, especially in the Northwest sector where we have a mountainous range uh, it's quite elevated and the harbor also is located in this part of the island. So there we have wind acceleration also, which uh, gave gusts exceeding 120 kilometers per hour. So you can see that between 1st February to 3rd February, the whole island remained under the influence of a gust exceeding 100 kilometers per hour. The rainfall distribution after the passage of uh, the intense tropical cyclone Batsirai. So the rainfall distribution also is much influenced by the topography of the island. And most of the rainfall was reported on the 2nd of February after the cyclone crossed uh, to the, its nearest point of the island. So that's what, that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Merci Viman, merci pour cette euh, excellente présentation et euh, pour nous avoir euh, montré comment euh, Maurice a pu euh, avertir ses populations lors de l'arrivée de ce cyclone et euh, de ce fait réduire euh, les euh, dommages en, en permettant à la population de se préparer euh, pour euh, l'arrivée, le passage de ce, de ce cyclone. Et on souhaite que la, la saison cyclonique se termine bien euh, pour, pour, pour vos populations dans, dans, dans la région et qu'il n'y aura pas d'autres euh, dommages importants. Merci beaucoup. I would like now to pass the floor to uh, Jemima uh, from uh, the Kenya Metrologic Department and also very much welcoming also the first uh, woman presentation in this, in this webinar. Uh, we try to strive to have also gender. This is very important also for us. And uh, thanks Jemima for, for uh, joining and providing us a presentation about the forecasting over the Lake Victoria storms 
using the um, no casting SAF uh, product. Also, before you start, I just would like to inform the people because some of the presenters have spoken about the no casting SAF quite a lot. We will have a presentation this afternoon by the no casting SAF. So if you are more interested into this tool, please join us also in the afternoon. And uh, Xavier Calbet from the Spanish Med Services will introduce uh, the no casting tool. So Jemima, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to share our experiences as Kenyans on how useful the NWC SAF products have been to us. Um, I hope that my screen is visible. All fine, yes. Okay, thank you very much. So this is a particular case about uh, that occurred on 25th of February on uh, over the Lake Victoria on the Kenyan side of Lake Victoria. And uh, this presentation is prepared by myself, Jemima Gasherungoma, and my colleague, David Koros. Both of us are forecasters at the Kenya Meteorological Department. So. Um, I'm experiencing some technical issue. I do not see my screen. I'm moving to the next slide. We are so still please allow me to stop sharing and share fresh, if yes. that's okay. Thank you. Um, let me share it again. Just a minute. We can also share it on our side, Jemima, if you prefer. Um, let me, yes, please do that for me because okay. I seem to have more than one screen open. We'll do that and you just indicate when you yes, want us to that, move that to the next slide. Me. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you. I can see okay. that. Okay, yes. next slide, please. Okay, so this is a brief overview of our presentation. First, we'll take just a short introduction of Lake Victoria and what it means to our region. And then we will look at the forecasting tools, what is available to forecasters in Kenya currently. And we will see how um, NWC SAF is making a difference to forecasting. Next slide, please. So uh, Lake Victoria is actually Africa's largest lake and we share it with uh, Uganda and Tanzania. And um, it is a major contributor to our economy as a country. As at 2018, it was estimated that it had contributed about 650 uh, million USD worth of fish. So that is actually quite a large amount. And um, given that we are now four years down the road, that figure is definitely much higher. Now, the kind of uh, fishing that is done is mainly commercial and the vessels are um, quite equipped to deal with the uh, adverse weather conditions. But aside from being used for fishing, the lake is also uh, used for transport. So this is where actually the, the weather hazards come in because as you can see from the image that is displayed, transporters usually use some small boats and their manual, they use oars to, to navigate. So it becomes quite uh, tricky for them when they're navigating during severe weather. So as you can see from that small caption there, that was a, a tragedy that occurred on 21st of September last year where two people actually drowned during a storm on Lake Victoria. So our next slide, please. Okay, so these are the forecasting tools that are available uh, to us. And um, we just give a brief overview of the storm itself. It occurred on 25th of February this year, and uh, it was mainly concentrated on the Kenyan side. Now, uh, on the ground from our synoptic stations, we had one station that was on the, that is actually on the southern shores of the lake 
recording 49.5 millimeters of rainfall within a 24 hour period. Then further to the eastern side of the lake, we had Kisumu reporting 18.3 millimeters. So that was quite a, a large amount of rainfall. And um, the rain started at about 1700 UTC. And it extended up to 2 a.m. in the morning. So this was actually somewhere in between the time when the, the fishermen are leaving and the morning when they're supposed to be coming back. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the forecasting tools that were available on that particular day. And we look at them uh, from the global all the way to the the local model that we ran. So we had the UK Met Office uh, model and it was showing sh some rainfall, but the rainfall was not actually over the lake. So the rainfall was a bit displaced. We can see there's an area that you can see a bit of red color and a V that is actually where the rainfall was expected to be heaviest. Then looking at the NSEP model, this one did not actually depict any storms over Lake Victoria. And um, we also ran a four kilometer model, WAF. And uh, this one was also not able to detect that storm. So we see that if just relying on NWP alone, that is a storm that would not have been de detected, yet we can see that it was actually high impact weather. Um, next slide, please. So we look at now what NWC staff was offering. Thank you. So this is a, a video showing how the storm uh, propagated. So um, this tool is actually known as a rapidly developing thunderstorms and it shows various stages of uh, convective storms. So we can see that the storm had actually started uh, earlier on in the day over Uganda. And then as the day progressed, it now started shifting south towards Kenya. So you can see the areas that are in deep red color that shows that the storm was growing and it grew and matured. You can see the purple as uh, new cells were forming, uh, growing, maturing and decaying. So we saw that the duration of the storm was quite long and the usefulness of this, this tool, the rapidly developing thunderstorm by NWCSAF is that we were actually able to see the storm as it was growing, as it was going through the various stages, something that the other models were not able to capture. So this was a 15 minute interval um, depiction of the storm showing how it progressed throughout the night. Um, Yes, so we just, the video is about a minute long. Let's just watch it for a while and then we see that was the end as it dissipated and moved further out into the open lake. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you. So aside from the, you can uh, please play the video. Aside from the rapidly developing thunderstorm, there is also another tool that shows the rate of uh, convective rainfall. And this one is also a useful tool to see just how much rainfall is likely to be generated by that storm. And again, you can clearly see how the storm was shifting from Uganda all the way to Kenya. And we can see that this tool was actually showing that there was going to be a substantial amount of rainfall about uh, 10 millimeters per hour on the maximum. And just watching it, you can see it's showing even the time when the, the rainfall was likely to be most intense because of course it was a long storm, but there were points at which the rainfall was likely to be more intense. And you can see how it shifts from the Northern sides of the lake all the way to the South where Suba is and where the 49 millimeters were recorded. And as we proceed forward, we can see it depicts clearly how the storm actually uh, moved to the open lake. So again, these are just part of the tools that are available from NWC SAF. And you can see that they are quite useful for the short range monitoring, just um, 15 minute by 15 minute monitoring of severe weather. Uh, next slide, please. So um, what, what, how does all of this information help us? Uh, for one, we see clearly that just these two tools, and they're not the only ones that are available from the NWC SAF tool. There are quite a number of tools, but these particular ones, the RDT and the 
uh, CRR actually allow forecasters to detect and now cast storms over Lake Victoria, where it is very crucial given the, the kind of activities that are being done there and the kind of severe weather that the fishers and the transporters are exposed to. Then of course, this has been mentioned by uh, previous presenters that um, uh, satellite-based now casting tools like NWCSAF actually fill the gap that is left by the short range forecasting. Where we are talking about six to five hours being the short range forecasting, but you can see that there is a gap between the zero hours to six hours where the NWP models are actually not able to capture the features that are occurring during that time period. So NWC staff is able to fill that gap. So in terms of the particular applications for East Africa, and Lake Victoria in particular, there is an obvious uh, opportunity for this tool, the NWC staff to be used to issue uh, now casting products to fishermen and transporters. We know that the, the, the kind of fishing that takes place in Lake Victoria is actually quite organized. There are people there who are called beach managers who actually oversee the operations of fishing. Uh, they inform the, the people going out to fish about the weather, about the conditions of the lake, all those things. So if they are equipped with information about now casting, that would be something that can actually save lives. And of course, in a situation like this one where we see that the storm took place from the moment when the fishermen were supposed to be leaving to go out into the lake because they fish at night up to the early hours of the morning when they were supposed to be coming back. With this kind of information, the beach managers would actually have been able to inform the transporters who use those manual boats that the lake is not okay today. So ideally with this kind of information, there shouldn't have been any uh, manual boats operating on the Kenyan side of Lake Victoria. So. Uh, NWC staff is actually quite important for that in Lake Victoria. And also uh, this reiterates what I think uh, Professor Parker had already mentioned, that there is opportunity for NWC staff to be used at airports, because this is not, um, uh, this is, these are areas where severe weather has to be constantly monitored. And you can see the tool offers more than just satellite imagery. There is a lot more that goes into it that can give the forecaster on duty at an aeronautical desk information that is crucial for the operations of the airport. Uh, next slide, please. So what would we like to see, uh, particularly for East Africa? We would like to just uh, come to a situation where NWC staff is available to more forecasting centers, whereby uh, forecasters are able to easily access these tools. Because as a forecaster, we are always looking for tools that can give us better forecasts. That is always our purpose, to keep improving and improving and improving. So this is a tool that should be availed to more and more forecasters. And then, of course, we look forward to the operalization of um, now casting in East Africa. Uh, as mentioned, it is mainly South Africa that has been doing it. But now with the swift and the, the kind of knowledge and skills that we have learned, we're actually in a position as KMD to, uh, to make it operational. And this is something that we are currently working on. So by the time we start uh, reporting on uh, now casting in Africa, we will have some good uh, uh, cases for Kenya as an operational now casting center. Uh, thank you very much. I think I have come to the end of my presentation. Merci beaucoup, Jemima. Thank you very much. Yes, thank it was an so example of uh, the use of the no-casting SAF tools uh, at Kenya to prevent and to forecast and to show how these no-casting tools can see things that the forecasting model could not uh, predict. And it's an ex excellent example that uh, demonstrates how useful no casting uh, can be in and complement to forecasting, obviously. Uh, without further ado, uh, that we are, uh, I would like also now to pass the floor to Maureen from the Ghana Meteorological Agency. Uh, so Maureen, if you can start sharing your uh, slides. And Maureen will speak to us more about the downstream, I would say. So once the forecast is done, how do we deliver this information to users with an example in Ghana? So Maureen, please, uh, the floor is yours. Okay. 
Thank you very much. And then good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Um, Maureen has mentioned by Vincent, and then I'm a senior meteorologist at a Ghana Meteorological Agency, and basically I work in the hydro meteorological units. Um, so for this presentation, I'm going to take you through how we deliver now casting to users in Ghana, and I'm going to show you some practical um, examples that we've done with users. And then first of all, I also like to thank SWIFT for this opportunity. Likewise, you must, uh, you must start for the capacities they've given us to be able to do this work. So for this presentation, my outline will be in three categories. The first one, I'm going to briefly take you through the NALCAST approach in, in Ghana and how we disseminate our information to users. Then um, contributions Swift has made to NALCASTing in, in, in Ghana, then some evidence of um, the impact that NALCASTing has um, um, improved or resulted in Ghana. So um, I think um, when John Marshall was making this presentation, <laughs> I didn't know he's also going to talk about, he has mentioned some of these things already, trying to describe how um, now casting is more defined towards in Africa. And they, they, that's a paper by Robert et al where they discuss um, some three criteria that should be considered. And this was defined due to the, the various um, variability we have in our weather patterns across Africa, as well as data availability. So with this, I'm going to emphasize that in Ghana, um, before um, and, and the staff came, uh, came into being or uh, being provided by SWIFT, we were already undergoing um, now casting, but we just that uh, we were not using more of like automated format to generate this. We we're more doing um, using satellite products and that. So I will say SWIFT has helped us to be able to um, complete the three criteria that they have mentioned by providing us the end of this stuff, which will help us to do forward extrapolation, trying to use um, um, more dynamic and then technical uh, approach or techniques to be able to study the weather, especially for high impact weather, which is very important to users. So in, in Ghana, we, we use different formats to communicate our weather to um, our users or stakeholders. And as I mentioned earlier, on based more on numerical weather prediction or satellite products or images. And these are some of the products that we use from USA, ECMW, UK Met Office, NOAA, Meteo um, France. And some of these um, satellite products are all embedded into the synergy which has been used. So in communicating high impact weather, these are some of the templates that we use in communicating the high weather. So in terms of the categories of NALCAS areas that we, we generate this NALCAS, especially for high impact weather, I classify them into the public weather, uh, which have agric energy, water, disaster, um, et cetera, stakeholders involved in there. Then for the aviation sector and then marine, these are places where we communicate to them in terms of high impact weather. Um, so in terms of um, ways in which we disseminate this information to the users are true. We use our website, TV, radio, email, um, WhatsApp, Telegram, Facebook, and then Twitter. But through my presentation, I'm going to focus on, focus on one of the dissemination channels, that's WhatsApp, as how we engage our users there. So likewise to this, also another system that we call the Weather Information Dissemination System, which has been, um, been a collaboration between GMET, Macquarie University in Uganda, and the University of Ghana to, to help also disseminate um, this forecast to people in, in time. When we have all the products at our end, if you, that we've done our good forecast, it must be received by users. So how to communicate this to them in time, this system is also going to come and also has a session for audio. For, for especially those who cannot read or write to be able to understand the focus in their local language. So in terms of the contributing um, of SWIFT to, to and or now casting in Ghana, there are a lot of capacity building that we have received as mentioned by Jemima. But for Ghana, um, we, we've also provided with the NWC soft products as you can see or tools as you can see from the screen. And this is for both research and then the operational center. So the research is at King University 
And uh, I will gladly say that Kenya still has been able to help GMET to do this installation, which is more of like a self-reliance. We have built capacity in that um, installation process. And I can gladly say these services can also be extended to other um, MET um, regions if you have to install this in, uh, in other MET offices or outside Ghana. Then it has also helped users to um, researchers or forecasters to be able to understand the installation process as well as how to use the NWC stuff in general. So as the journey began with SWIFT, um, we did a lot of um, user engagement to help users also understand what, if we, we really talk about now casting what involves, and through this, the concept of impact base came into being, which is not done um, operationally at GMET, but through SWIFT, we've been able to have capacity building towards impact based forecasting and this is going to be the start to it through the help of SWIFT. So we, we as you can see, we have um, different workshops held at different parts of the country, both north and south. And then the was how are users able to take decisions or informed decision in time so that they, they, they reduce impact that are caused by this high impact weather event. So through this workshop, there was a policy brief that has been developed out of this um, user engagement that we had more relating to high impact weather as well as impact based forecasting. So the journey still continues. Um, there were other training in other areas, but we also have more training also into the now casting as well as impact based forecasting. So before this training, as you can see from the right, um, that's from my screen on my right, or to you, maybe using the maybe like the old template format, but we started using some products from the uh, NWC staff to communicate the weather. So um, as a, as, as for forecasters and researchers together, uh, which was validated with the um, which was validated with users, the product that we have we have developed, and then how this forecast could be interpreted, interpreted and then understood, and how they can use it in decision making. Uh, I will also say through Swift um, projects, we've also, we have um, the WhatsApp platform as I mentioned for dissemination. And then through Swift projects, we went further to see how we can engage users through citizen science approach. So we use this method to do some analysis to see how users um, information or feedback that are shared with us um, help in forecast evaluation or also helps the forecaster or the meteorologist together to understand how these informations um, are being used as well as maybe areas that we do not have station to get real-time observation. They, they, they come in to help to argument for those information. So as you can see from the screen, these are just samples of how sometimes users communicate to us on our WhatsApp platform, um, feedback in terms of if we issue weather warning, of, of, of high impact weather or we generate forecast in general, how these things are happening over their area. And we can see some of this information coming in real time. So for further um, reading, you can visit this link to, to get more reading into, into that. So as I mentioned, this were the WhatsApp platforms, the various WhatsApp platforms, as at the time this analysis was done, so this was the, showing the various number of people who um, participated in, in or give feedback to, for those high impact weather events for three different categories. And we also try to assess the gender profile for the people who participated in this uh, feedback sharing. So we see that most of them were more um, male dominating, the female participation was not too good. And we still need to encourage more women in weather and climate information sharing as well as high impact weather as well, because if any high impact weather event okay, they, they stand more vulnerable as well as children. So as you can also see from the screen, the, the observations that we plotted based on the event that happens on the various this, um, this that we tested as 10th May, 28th and 30th May. So we compared those information with the stations that we recorded the rainfall amount from, and then map that also to, to see how this uh, user's feedback came. So to, to verify how the events perform. And from the feedback session, you can see that there's kind of a good correlation or showing kind of a pattern as where the storms track over the period. So um, we try to now use the NWC staff product to validate and see how the NWC staff product was able to 
capture this event. And for, for this case, we showed a sample of the RDT, the, the rapidly developing thunderstorm images showing the various initiation, the, the growth and then maturity to, towards decaying process for the various case studies. And we tried to compute some skills metrics to see how the performance of the forecast together with how other, uh, the performance of the forecast went the, what we received from the users. So the next set of um, uh, evidence that I also show is as the first one was more towards the citizen science approach. The next one we had through the uh, test bed evaluation and we, we brought some users on board. So um, uh, we did the evaluation with them for about, uh, let me say almost two weeks, but I'm just going to show you um, just a sample of some results that we had. So for now, we'll focus on just the first two days. And as you can see, this way, the, the blue shows the number of people who participated in the weather briefing. So we generated the forecast. So we, we engaged the users, we explained to them how the forecast is, is going to be like, and then we required of them to give us feedback. So the yellow color or gold color shows the, the feedback that we had based on, on the focus that were issued for these two days. And as you can see from the bar charts, the wine one showing on the, the 14th, the, the various stakeholders that participated or users that participated in this um, 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 evaluation session. And then for the 15 also shows the, the various users who also participated in that. And we can see maybe on the, for, for the first day, it was 14th, it was more towards the Greek sector. And then the second day, the, the highest was more to the responses were from the disaster risk management sector. However, we had uh, different representation from this, the various sectors. So we went further to um, now um, per the evaluations that we, we did, the questions that were sent to them. I'm showing just a sample that we, we asked them to let us understand the forecast that they have received. What did they like per the high weather information that was issued, high weather impacts forecast that was issued to them? How did they understand it? And then after the events, did what they were expecting based on the forecast or what the forecast was saying, did, uh, were they able to experience that? And as you can see, for the 14th, this was what was um, expected and this was what was observed. And then on the 15th to the A shows what is expected and what was uh, observed. And um, we can see the, the, the closeness is quite okay, but the, the various um, uh, weather phenomenon that was, was expected. And I'll gladly say that this forecast was issued to them using the, the new impact based template that um, was generated through the SWIFT projects, which was done in collaboration with the users. So it was more of co-production or co-design and evaluated. So we also went further to compute the, the, the skill of the, the forecast or based on the feedback, mm -hmm. what was expected and what was received. And this were the, the skills that were, were, were found. And then I, I could say that uh, the performance was was not too was not too bad. It was quite good for for the feedback that we have had, and this approach was based. The skills call approach was based on the contingency method. So, um, just to also show you how the uh, RBT also were able to capture events for those. Um, um, feedback or forecast that we have issued. So I decided to show um, the RDT product from the NWC staff and then the MSG infrared 10.8 um, channel imagery. So um, what I'm just trying to communicate here is just relying on the MSG. Fine, we will see the satellite, um, um, the cloud types, using um, from the satellite directly, you, if you know how to interpret the forecasters, they use the color codes to defend the, very, uh, the thickness of the cloud. But one good thing that the RDT um, keeps is it's, it shows you from these clouds, even though you may know the various um, cloud temperature top or thickness, the RDT is able to show you how this initiation involving those that are decaying, those that are, are, are growing to be able to cause more impact to inform um, the forecast that will be issued for any um, warning or to help in uh, decision making. So from, from that um, workshop, um, we also asked them to share how the, the forecast helped them to make decision. 
and we try to just give a summary of it in, in terms of the various sectors. So for energy, um, they even mentioned that when they were working on a transformer, they have to stop that and the focus was really helpful to them. To, to For someone from the general public, just in general, um, they have to get home early not to be caught by the rain, just trying to avoid uh, flood prone areas as well as um, they prepare to, to go to work by carrying an umbrella. For marine ladies, they were able to stop a road team from um, proceeding to sea because there's a high impact weather that was approaching. Um, for the Greek sector, some feedbacks were showing that uh, for a poultry farmer, he has to um, uh, add a heat source or provide heat source for, for the poultry, uh, for the, the, the chickens or eat beds to be able to keep them warm. So that's going to even help him in not planning. So that means there'll be no economic loss if the birds have to feel cold and then die or due to cold temperatures. Then uh, farmers have to also um, stop applying the insides that kind of after applying if it's rain, they're just going to wash it off and to be waste of money and there'll be no effect. So the focus helped them to make a decision and then dress. Um, one farmer was like, you have to dress um, to protect um, themselves from cold and did not go out with their animal to breathe. In terms of the aviation um, industry, which I'll say the NWC South uh, product is also very critical there, as Jemima also mentioned, um, they use it to plan flight uh, dispatch as well as it's also informed them to delay flights um, um, estimated the time of their arrival at the destination area. Then in terms of disaster, they also use it to alert flood prone communities. So we can see that it has really provided um, quite an uh, economic impact uh, for socioeconomic development. So in terms of the high, um, the impact-based forecast template that we have developed through the SWIFT projects. This was modified from Ghana. General Sham showed the general one that we had and we modified this for Ghana. And this was what we used during the, the test bed and was evaluated with the users. Uh, looking at the number of people who participated, we went further to engage more users to find out their view, whether they still um, like, if you have to communicate this information to them and how readily will it be will it be for them to be able to understand this and make in, uh, informed decisions. So as you can also see from the screen, the survey was showing the participation of uh, both the, in terms of gender and then the people who responded like greater than that's about 70, 79% of the people are responding to like, they really like this template and in compared to what we have earlier on. So in conclusion, I'll say the, um, and, and the NWC staff products is going to help document the, the already existing approach we were, going, we were using for now casting, which we improve early warning system. I also mentioned that as uh, the Parker mentioned, some places we used to have the radar, but currently is down. And I'll say the NWC staff is also timely, which is going to augment for that to help in communicating um, high impact weather. So we also use the social media, as I mentioned, to deliver weather information for, to users within the, the, the country in, in conjunction with TV and then the radio. Then African Street has really helped in the capacity building for meteorologists, both in operation and then in the research, um, that's academia. So for the academia, they're also going to use it to teach students and do more research to understand high impact weather and how best we can improve uh, on this within our sub-region. Then, as I mentioned, through the SWIFT project, we've been able to um, develop the impact-based forecast, which is going to help us now communicate our weather more based on impacts. And then um, there was an SOP also for um, how to communicate or generate the forecast for um, this um, high impact weather for the public sector. We already have one for the aviation sector. And then one, um, WhatsApp too has become a major medium for interaction between forecasters and the users, uh, or the user community, hence promoting citizen science. And it's also going to aid us, um, help users really understand better the, the importance of um, high impact weather or now casting in general. Then um, I also say there are still ongoing research to um, help inform the use of the NWC staff, uh, staff or NALCAST products and their use. Currently, um, the NWC staff do not really have what we have there, the channels we have do not really give dry, dry season information. Um, we're looking forward for this to be improved. And then we're also looking forward to extending this to the efforts for aeronautic focus. So on this note, um,
I'll bring my presentation to an end, but before I end, I'll say when all is done, when all is said and done, weather and love are the two elements about which one can never be sure, be sure of. This is said by Alias Hoffman. So this is just telling us that in as much as we put more effort to improve on our love to one another or to our loved ones, it's the same attitude we need to pay to weather, especially in terms of high impact weather. We need to improve um, communication of especially high impact weather to reduce the disaster that is being caused by this high impact weather. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maureen. Merci beaucoup. Thanks for this presentation. And also your video was upside down. Your message passed, passed very well and was very straight. So thank you a lot for me. Apart, of course, your last uh, quotations, I will uh, retain two main uh, aspects of your presentation is also the citizen science. I think this engagement with users and citizens and co-design. I think these are uh, two key aspects in delivering uh, no casting to uh, users that you uh, demonstrated through your presentation with also a concrete example of user feedback uh, that you have received. So thanks a lot for this presentation and stay with us, of course, for the QA uh, question that will follow. We are running a bit out of time, but we will have a fourth user case. Um, I, and this one uh, will be presented by Christophe Vernet uh, from Solais. I've seen also in the, in the Q&A that there was a question about what could be the role of the private sector in no-casting. And this one focusing on energy will be a good example where uh, private sectors could also actually use no-casting information and uh, support uh, communities and uh, companies in Africa. So Christophe, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. My name is Christophe Vernet, and, and I am a technical director in uh, Solais, a French company dedicated to uh, photovoltaic. We have been working with MinParitech, Armin, and SPI on uh, intra hourly probabilistic solar now casting based on MSG images. So the, the context is as follows. We are, we are talking about uh, an off-grid mining site, which is located southwest in uh, Mali, uh, where um, there is a uh, mini diesel power plant. Um, and uh, in uh, 2020, a photovoltaic plant, a PV plant has been commissioned in order to uh, reduce the use of uh, diesel. So in 2021, it did save 9 million liters of diesel, more, about 7 million euro per year. 30 million tons of CO2 equivalent per year, and it also reduces the constraints regarding the fuel supplying. The very big challenge in this project that we manage is uh, that we do not uh, couple a photovoltaic plant with the battery, with the storage. This allows to reduce the investment, the maintenance cost, um, and also the uh, corresponding env environmental impacts. The problem with uh, photovoltaic uh, is that is the, the variability of the, of the solar resource. So for that purpose, we need to uh, set up an uh, intra hourly probabilistic solar now casting, which is uh, either based on, uh, not either, which is both based on uh, MSG, Meteosat second generation images, and also on uh, fisheye cameras that I present. So the, the, the process is first based on long-term forecast, which is used for daily planification. But I will focus today on the short-term, the very short-term forecast that is used on the early horizon from five minutes to one hour to because, um, well, so, so for the solar now casting, uh, we are using, as I said, uh, satellite images on a 50 square kilometer area around the, the mine to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 uh, to make this uh, short term forecast of what will be the solar irradiance in the coming hour. But uh, the images cannot, uh, cannot um, capture all the, the cloud events. That's the reason why we have set up a PV drop detection based on uh, sky images. To, uh, to say to the, to the operator that uh, in the coming uh, 10 minutes, 
there will be some, uh, some uh, PV, some photovoltaic uh, drop due to a cloud event that the satellite couldn't capture. On this synoptic, you can see the, the, the mine on the left. You can see the PV generator, photovoltaic generator on the center. And here is the, the process. Um, so we, um, we, the, the, the satellite images uh, from MSG are retrieved by uh, SODA and uh, processed to, uh, to derive the irradiation maps uh, around, the, around the site. These maps are sent through a dedicated satellite internet link on the local server in, uh, in the, in the site, on site. These images are used to, uh, to perform a cloud motion vector uh, to, uh, to, to, to perform this uh, short-term forecasting, this uh, now casting of the, of, the, of the production. But as I said, it is not enough to capture what to, uh, to, uh, to, um, to face what the, the satellite could not capture. That's why we, we have set up a, um, a sky imager network around the, the PV plant, which uh, will give information on the, which will uh, perform cloud detection. And uh, the local server will uh, give the, the feedback, will uh, feedback all the information to the power management system in the, in the mine to, uh, to say to the operator and to, uh, let's say, to uh, automatically uh, start some specific uh, diesel engine to cope for some cloud events that uh, we could not uh, forecast it. On this uh, figure, you can, the, the top left uh, image is uh, the 50 square kilometer uh, clearness index that is derived uh, from the um, MSG images of the, it, it, it gives information we can, cannot really see, but uh, you have some red arrows that give information on the direction and the, the, on the velocity of the clouds. This allow to derive some uh, here, the center of the image here uh, is, the, is, the, is the mine, is the PV plant. And uh, so this cloud motion vector will give information of, of when will be the next shading uh, on, the, on, the, on the PV plant. Uh, in this curve in gray, you can see uh, a day for of the measured of the measurement in terms of uh, irradiation, the blue is the estimation of uh, of uh, Helioclim of uh, the estimation of the irradiation based on uh, MSG images. As you can see, uh, for instance, uh, at about uh, 3 p.m., we can see that uh, there are some uh, some cloud events that couldn't be captured, as I said, by the, the satellite images. Uh, and uh, in uh, red, blue, green, yellow, you can see the, the one hour short term probabilistic um, forecasting that is made using cloud motion vector. Red is the, the worst, the, the pessimistic forecast and yellow is the optimistic forecast. On the left uh, images, you can see that uh, it's the MSG images, which, uh, which, uh, which are processed to derive the uh, cloud motion vector. And uh, we can see that uh, the, um, the, the, the prediction, the one hour prediction is, uh, is, is running. And as I said, it, this uh, prediction couldn't capture at about five, four and five, couldn't capture uh, some events that, uh, some uh, cloud events that could not be uh, captured by the, by the satellite, of course. That's the reason why we have set up this uh, six uh, sky imager network around the, the PV plant and also on the other location of the, of the site. Every camera store one image each second of the, of the sky and it allows to detect, to, uh, the, the, to, to perform cloud detection and to, uh, to know what will be the, uh, the, what will be the, 
the, the next uh, the next cloud that is supposed to to make shade on the PV plant. We can see in this animation. We can see, as I said, the the uh, the cloud edge, uh, and um, as soon as there are some uh, some uh, some uh, some cloud that are approaching dangerously to the to the sun, there are, there are some computation that are made, and there, there is this uh, this uh, feedback directly to the power management system that allows to uh, to start some diesel diesel engines. I will spend a little more time uh, on the conclusion to uh, to uh, to fulfill this uh, the, the, the 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 timing, um, and I will uh, remind the, the the operational chain of this uh, solar now casting. So first, we we use uh, the MSG savory images. Which are broadcasted through UMED cast to a soda. Soda post processes these uh, images uh, to, uh, to, uh, to derive real time Helioclim 3 database. This database, well, a part of the database, uh, this uh, real time uh, information uh, regarding the solar irradiance is sent um, through a, a dedicated satellite internet link to um, to the the site the, the mining site and uh, these uh, cloud motion vector coupled with sky measures allow to perform this uh, local solar now casting that is now working since uh, 2011 um, 2020 sorry uh, using uh, uh, without using any uh, battery storage so right now we are able to say that we really think that there is no technical barrier. We do not see any technical barrier to finally to broadcast, to broadcast directly the surface solar irradiance information, for instance, using a Geonetcast Africa uh, as third party products. Um, but first we need to assess what is the interest of the community. Technically speaking, we, we see it's okay, uh, but uh, is there an interest for that? We need, to, we need to work about it. And we also need to investigate uh, IPR and also policies. And finally, we'll focus on the Meteosat third generation MTG, for which we expect a, a much better uh, surface solar radiance performances uh, because of its uh, higher temporal, spatial, and spectral resolutions. Uh, but for that, to get the most of the MTG performances, we need to, uh, to improve uh, the retrieval algorithms and the, to adapt the retrieval algorithms. And mostly, we need to change the, the paradigm, the paradigm, the, the processing chain paradigm to, um, to, to use uh, cloud processing, for instance, to use cloud processing with DIAS, for instance, uh, Wikio. And uh, what is important is that for we, we use we, we propose this to, to process the MTG images uh, as close as where they are stored. And, um, and for that, we, we must use uh, open dissemination, threads data server, and uh, also a broadcast service, uh, broadcast system such as a UMEDCAST, GeoNetCAST. Okay, so sorry. Uh, so thank you for, uh, for your attention and uh, uh, feel free to, if you have questions. Thank you. Merci, Christophe. Merci pour uh, cette présentation qui uh, démontre uh, l'utilisation du no casting dans un domaine uh, comme l'énergie, en fait, qui est un domaine aussi clé et qui est uh, très dépendant de la, de la météo et, de, et du climat, bien, bien évidemment. Et euh, je pense qu'avec cette présentation, nous avons conclu euh, la série de, de user cases, euh, de cas spécifiques de l'utilisation. Et vous avez pu voir euh, l'utilisation du non-casting dans différents domaines. Et je remercie euh, les quatre présentateurs, donc Vimal, Jemima, Maureen et Christophe, d'avoir bien voulu euh, prendre du temps pour partager avec nous euh, les applications concrètes du non-casting en Afrique. Nous venons également de lancer un nouveau petit questionnaire. Si vous pouvez euh, 
regarder sous le bouton questionnaire « Pulse » en anglais et répondre à la question sur euh, le, de savoir quel est le dernier exemple d'événement de, de, extrême qui a eu lieu. Donc, je vous laisse un peu de temps pour faire cela. Euh, nous avons eu, eu aussi euh, plusieurs questions qui ont été posées euh, dans euh, la partie « questions et réponses ». Euh, certaines de ces questions ont déjà été répondues euh, en, par écrit, donc je vous invite aussi à aller voir cela. Euh, quelques questions restent ouvertes. Il nous, reste, nous sommes un peu en retard, mais j'aimerais prendre le temps pour répondre à quelques-unes euh, de ces questions-là hein, en live. I would like to, take the, the, to give the opportunity also to my colleagues to answer some of the questions live. So we have um, one question. The first one is about what is the role of the private sector in filling the gap in space-based observation for no casting? Uh, what are the most critical gap in, uh, if any? So this comes from Aravin Ravi Chandran. So maybe here, I mean, there, there is two ways to answer. So you have seen there is some role of the private sector, certainly in the downstream, uh, creating services based on the satellite's observation and especially on the no casting product. This is, you have seen the last presentation, this was that. Maybe your question was more related to the space-based observation. So indeed, uh, we see more and more uh, private companies also running satellites. Um, I can give an example with Spire, uh, by example, from the US with uh, running radio occultation satellites. And this indeed complements what uh, satellite operators like UMETSAT, NOAA, uh, the Chinese meteorological agencies can offer. Uh, to be more specific <laughs> on, on your question, Aravind, I would like to invite you to join one of the presentations this afternoon, which will be on METEOSAT's third generation, because you will see that already, let's say, the public sector will offer Uh, more uh, free data, uh, satellite data for no casting over Africa. But obviously, there are still places, like I'm thinking more on radio occultations or on sounding maybe instruments that uh, from a geostationary orbit and things like that. So I really invite you to follow the, the presentation this afternoon on uh, Metosat third generation that will give you a few more hints uh, in uh, response to your questions. Um, we have another question also from uh, African Development Bank, uh, Adeni. Uh, so this is Adeni from the African Development Bank, uh, and he has a question for Vimal uh, about how Mauritius Meteorological Services is supporting NDRMC and MPA, MPA using no casting. So I don't know if Vimal, you would like to take the floor and answer this one live. Yes, uh, Vincent. In fact, uh, I replied uh, at any, uh, through the chat. Uh, I, 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 so I think uh, he wanted to know uh, uh, how we are using now costing, in fact, uh, for disaster risk reduction in Mauritius. So already we have a Doppler weather radar, which is very useful, in fact, for now costing in Mauritius. And at the same time, uh, in Mauritius, we have different warnings for different weather hazards. So depending on which weather ha hazard, whether it is Uh, swell, which is going to affect the island, so we are going to issue a warning for, for heavy swell. And if it is a hydrometeorological hazard, that is thunderstorm or heavy rain, so we have a specific warning for that. I hope that uh, will answer uh, Adinei's question. Yes, thank you. And uh, we have also one question from Julien Zemo. The question is in French, but I will translate it maybe for uh, Duke about uh, how, how can we do to get the SWIFT system uh, in uh, RDC. Um, and then um, also he was asking also on a specific uh, question about fog, if there are any tool also to uh, predict fogs. So I don't know if Doug or Veza, you would like to pick this question. I can answer in regard to the SWIFT system. Uh, so the, in SWIFT, we have been using the NWC SAF um, solution. So this, this system is you know, available to all the weather services. We have made 
these products available on a web page with a password protection um, because they are live data, they're protected. Um, but we are talking with UMETSAT and with WMO about making the password available to more partners. So we hope to be able to make progress on that. Um, we've also uh, learned the know-how to install new systems. So if you heard the presentation from Maureen uh, ah Ahiataku um, from Ghana, uh, in Ghana, the, the university and the weather service, GMET, have cooperated to install the system locally. So in fact, there is African expertise to support that installation. Um, so uh, in future, I hope that we will be able to support more countries to install this, um, <clears throat> but that the, the assistance will be within Africa um, and, and will be making use of African capacity. Merci. Euh, en complément, je voudrais aussi souligner, euh, Julien, que euh, effectivement les outils sont disponibles. Euh, ce qui est souvent plus difficile, c'est les efforts pour, pour, pour euh, renforcer les capacités, euh, notamment à Metelsat ou dans, dans votre pays, pour pouvoir utiliser, installer et utiliser ces différents outils. Et je vous invite, par exemple, je sais qu'en RDC, il y a un des projets Cruise euh, qui est en cours ou qui était planifié. Et peut-être dans le cadre de, de, de projets tels que Cruise, euh, vous pourriez faire une demande pour avoir euh, ces outils-là euh, installés et pris en compte dans le cadre de financement euh, Cruise. Euh, C'est une suggestion que je vous fais euh, pour cela. Et pour les… Euh, donc, voilà. Je, pour l'instant, je crois que nous allons clôturer cette petite euh, session de Q&A. Nous avons encore deux présentations. Nous sommes un peu en retard. Nous allons déborder de quelques minutes, mais j'aimerais passer à vous like not to pass the floor to Zachary uh, um, Atelou from ICPAC for a presentation about the, the, the disaster situation room uh, that has been running at ICPAC and how no casting uh, satellite based data are uh, included into this, this disaster situation room. So, Zachary, if you are with us, you could start sharing your screen. Uh -huh. uh, okay. Or we can run the presentation on our side also, if you prefer, let us know. I think so, because I don't see it. Eh? Yeah, yeah okay. just run from the other side, yeah, because I don't seem to see it. Eh? We will share it from our side then, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. <coughs> Here it is. Floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Vincent. Uh, I'm Zachar uh, working for ICPAC, and uh, I'm making this presentation on behalf of my colleagues who are in the Disaster Operations Center, Viola and Julie, who could not be able to present because they're on travel. Next, please. The next, let's go to the next also. Next. Okay, uh, IGA and Climate Prediction and Application Center is a, a specialized institution of uh, IGA. Uh, it is started as a drought monitoring center, but it was absorbed uh, into IGA and the name changed into IGA and Climate Prediction and Application Center to deal with the aspect of uh, climate in the region. We are WMO designated uh, climate center we are disseminated in May 2017, and we serve 11 countries in Eastern Africa. And uh, we have state, uh, observer status with the uh, UNFCCC. Uh, our disaster operation center was officially opened in October last year. And um, we will see about what they are doing. Next, please. Uh, these are kind of services we do. We do climate uh, monitoring and forecasting. We have disaster risk management program. We have water resources program. We have food security nutrition work group. Uh, we deal with climate change. We are now dealing with climate information and co-production, especially during the regional climate outlook forums. We do environmental monitoring and also capacity development for the region. Next. 
Now, this is our disaster operation center that was opened last year. Uh, it's uh, to provide people center and what has an early warning information uh, and strengthen early warning in the Igan region. Uh, if you look at that, is that uh, the orange uh, color is what is already currently uh, phase one. We are dealing with the drought, floods, pests, food insecurity. And then in phase two, we plan about uh, forecasting tropical cyclones. Although there's even now some aspect of tropical cyclones, we can go to landslides and also pandemic, uh, pandemics. Uh, the core functions of this EGAN uh, Disaster Operations Center is to monitor major hazards and issue early warning for the region. We coordinate with the national focal points for early action. Uh, we rapidly map affected areas and uh, provide impact of disasters and we strengthen capacity of the region. Uh, next. Uh, we have uh, several uh, uh, systems, uh, multi-hazard early warning system. Uh, we call it East African Hazard Watch. Uh, we have uh, recently also launched Drought Watch. We have Agriculture Watch, uh, Forest Watch, and also the East Africa Hazard Watch. Next. Uh, how do we use satellite information and uh, now current products for early warning in the disaster operation center? This is what I'm going to present next in the coming from the next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, in East Africa and Hazard Watch, uh, you can have many products. And one of them is a weekly exceptional rainfall. Uh, you can find there and also uh, we also provide within there um, with a sense of precipitation estimate, uh, which uh, indicates uh, the kind of rainfall we have, among others. You, here you have many layers in the East Africa Asset Watch, uh, but can provide uh, many uh, uh, layers and uh, the satellite information uh, heavily used in this uh, uh, watch. Next. We have also the flood monitoring, and here we are using flood, global flood awareness system. Uh, it, this is an automated satellite-based monitoring system for plants in real time, near new, real, real, real time. Uh, this uh, we are using uh, in the situation room, mainly to monitor plants in the region, and we produce a continental watch bulletin. The information generated from this is uh, developed into a bulletin, and uh, this is shared across Africa. Uh, next. Uh, although we send a tropical cyclone is for the next phase, but uh, in the situation room, we capture uh, the tropical cyclone monitoring that happens uh, on real time. Uh, uh, which we get the satellite information. Uh, we have also the winds uh, uh, from GFS, and this can be able to track the tropical cyclone. This is the case of the recent one, uh, which uh, passed over Madagascar. Uh, and um, uh, this is updated every 30 minutes. Uh, for now, we are using what is there, but we want to customize this further and uh, issue uh, more uh, uh, kind of prediction. This is more like uh, monitoring, but we need us to enhance this and uh, have a predictive uh, component. That's why we say this is in phase two, but already in the situation room, you'll be able to find this on uh, near real time uh, and it's being updated every that minute. Next. Uh, uh, the drought uh, watch is also uh, for continuing monitoring of drought conditions across the Eastern Africa region. Uh, this updates uh, the indexes every 10 days. 
uh, we have sat satellite data, we have also model and also station data combined. And then uh, you have these indicators, they like uh, precipitation anomaly, you have soil uh, moisture anomaly and the vegetation index anomaly. Uh, we have adopted this from global drought observatory and it is customized for our region. Uh, it is now operational after customizing for our region. And one can be able to do many things in this system. You can generate your own drought report. You can view and download the drought related indicators. Uh, some users have used it like in the last day, Gakov, uh, participant from Somalia uh, informed the meeting that uh, they use the information from the drought world to inform about the state of emergency in their country in November last year. Next. Uh, we have also agricultural work. This is also adopted uh, from uh, working with the GRC, GRC and is continuous monitoring of crop areas and regional in our region. It uses satellite and weather data, uh, layers uh, for every 10 days, uh, and uh, you have precipitation, water satisfaction index, vegetation also indices, and the temperature. And this also is already being used, and the people in, uh, uh, expert in the region have been trained on how to use it and generate a product, and eventually, they are producing a, a, a agricultural monitoring bulletin. Next. We have also forest watch uh, because uh, to be able to see the rate of deforestation in the region, uh, this mainly uses Landsat and Sentinel 1 and 2. And uh, this is uh, part of the environmental monitoring. So, and this is also there people to see how the vegetation is changing with time. Next. Now, uh, what is our future? Well, our future is to follow up with Akiman and South, South Africa Weather Service regarding operationalization of the RAS station. That was installed at Tick Park uh, uh, recently. And this will enable us to improve on uh, numerical weather prediction. Uh, we also want to link with the now cast staff to access products for use in the Egan Disaster Operations Center station room. We, we are saying now we have started, but there is room for improvement. And if we operationalize the RAS station to improve the numerical weather prediction and also link with the now cast staff to assess those products uh, so that they can be able to improve our disaster operations station room. Thank you very much. Thank you, very Thank, you. Much. Thank you, Zachary. Thanks uh, for uh, showing us uh, this uh, various tool actually used by ICPAC operationally as a multi-hazard uh, early warning system in various application fields. We can see this, this presentation has broadened a little bit the scope of no casting to various uh, time scale. Uh, we have seen that as part of a complete uh, multi-hazard early warning system, uh, there are some aspects which are very relevant for no casting, some other more for uh, climate predictions or for uh, forecasting. But uh, through this presentation, we have had a nice view on how the different uh, tools could be actually integrated to build a, a quite complete uh, multi-hazard early warning system addressing various uh, fields. So thank you, uh, Zachary. Last presentation for these first sessions will be from uh, Duke about uh, capacity building and training opportunities. And uh, Duke, I pass you the floor, and then we will conclude this uh, first session. Thank you, Vincent. So, um, I want to say a few things about um, the uh, capacity building which is needed to, uh, to establish now casting. Uh, there have been some questions in the Q&A <clears throat> and the chat around this. So maybe I will provide some uh, remarks from the experience of the SWIFT project. 
So the things I will talk about here is uh, the model of what we call a test bed uh, as a, a, a method for training and particularly for knowledge exchange and co-production of solutions, uh, standard operating procedures and uh, the future initiatives that we envisage. So firstly, just to introduce the concept of a test bed, uh, SWIFT introduced the first test beds to Africa. In the USA, test beds are held every year for severe weather forecasting. Um, in SWIFT, we, we had three test beds, uh, and the aims of these were to bring together researchers, forecasters, and users of forecast to co-produce solutions and to test the methods in real time. So these have been discussed a little by some of the previous talks. Uh, we used real-time uh, observations uh, to create uh, now casting. We developed standard operating procedures, which were, were, um, which were tested and used um, as was presented earlier, particularly for Ghana. So how can test beds be brought into uh, the principles of training? So now casting is very practically focused. One thing we learned from the test beds in SWIFT was that now casting only really makes sense if you think about a particular user sector. So you have to focus on the user needs to make sense of now casting. So that may be focusing on one city or one airport or, or one uh, user who may be an agricultural user, an agricultural reason, region. So to train people in now casting, a now caster needs to understand the principles of remote sensing. They need to understand the data. They need to understand about uh, the dynamics of the weather, they need to understand the synoptic dynamics, uh, but in particular, they need to know about operational procedures and communication. So this comes into the practical examples. So I think practical examples are necessary uh, for now casting training uh, and real time uh, uh, know how. So now casting is new to tropical Africa, as has been said a number of times, there has not been much now casting done uh, outside South Africa. Uh, so there is a lot to learn and the forecasters themselves bring a lot to this process. So it's really a knowledge exchange. So that's another reason why a test bed is an important environment. Um, the trainers have a lot to learn from the forecasters as well as the other way around. Um, so co-production uh, with between forecasters and researchers is necessary, but also with users. So the testbed philosophy is one of a knowledge exchange and it respects the fact that the forecasters have important prior knowledge, as do the users. So here's an example uh, from Ghana. Uh, so this is provided by uh, Samuel Awusu Ansa from GMET. Uh, and this is what was done in Ghana. So the, the standard operating procedure was customized. Forecasters were trained uh, how to use the NWC SAF products. Um, users were also trained uh, and a co-production process took place to develop the kind of charts which were uh, seen here. And, and Maureen also showed similar charts. Um, the ensemble uh, model products were also brought into this. Uh, and in fact, forecasters and researchers were trained in, in how to generate products, especially for uh, a particular user. The standard operating procedures are particularly important here. So that there's some text here from the standard operating procedure that SWIFT developed. Um, these are important for training because they enable trainers who may in fact be in a university or maybe in another country to design the learning objectives of their courses to be relevant to operational practice. And they enable another country, if you're new to now casting, you can take the standard operating procedure from from the SWIFT testbed or from another country like Ghana or, or Kenya, and you can uh, adapt it for your own users and your own context. Uh, so a now casting chapter is being written in a forecasting, the forecasters handbook for East Africa, which is in preparation, and that will be linked to these standard operating procedures. <clears throat> so in terms of training in SWIFT, a number of initiatives are going ahead at KNUST, um, in Kumasi in Ghana, a training lab has been installed um, and uh, the data is being acquired locally, but there's a backup data stream from the UK. Uh, and a now casting module is going to be introduced into the undergrad, the university degrees uh, here. So five trainers have already been trained within SWIFT uh, to work at the university at KNUST. 
In Kenya, at the University of Nairobi, uh, they have just installed a classroom. And again, they have the receiver a satellite dish installed, and they're due to inaugurate this training room uh, next month, uh, which should train, train a number of students every year. Uh, and here's a list of other initiatives which is going ahead. ACMAD, um, we already heard from Andre Kamga, the, the director at ACMAD, uh, and is, is bringing an outcasting into its on-the-job training. NIMET is also uh, training in nowcasting and synoptic uh, interpretation. Anasim in Senegal um, it has plans for this. And uh, just to say that the, the delivery of the data for training uh, will continue from the UK. So we are available at NCAS in Leeds to support uh, training in nowcasting in Africa. And, and we're happy to talk with, uh, with colleagues about supporting that. So where we're going with this next um, is to focus on African-led creation and delivery of training. So ACMAD, of course, is, is part of its remit, is the on-the-job training and the training modules, uh, which are in development at the universities and at the, the RTC in Nigeria. Uh, sharing of training materials uh, and the, the chapter in the handbook. We were, we we're talking with WMO and UMETSAT about bringing some of these methods into the, the long-term training, which WMO and UMETSAT do and are committed to. Uh, and then extension to other countries uh, and extending the, uh, the methods which we have developed in four countries in SWIFT uh, and making those available to other countries. So that's where I think we see the, the direction for training in nowcasting going in future. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Thanks for this uh, presentation of uh, further possibilities for capacity building and training. I would like also to mention that in the chat, there have been a few mentions also of some planned training course. Notably, there is one uh, that UMETSAT is planning together with the African Center for uh, Metrological Training. Uh, notably, one specific ASMET African Satellite Metrological Training course, which will start on 3rd of May until the 2nd of June, it will be an online courses, and my colleagues will present it uh, as part of uh, the presentation uh, this afternoon, but you can find in the chat the link for that. There was also um, uh, Arno von Lieshout, uh, who mentioned the European Space Agency Earth Observation Africa initiative, which uh, has started and uh, have also uh, some possibilities for uh, capacity building and training and uh, developing uh, some uh, project or demonstrations. So I invite you also to look at the chat and find the link. I think we will also, um, for the end of the webinar, also collect all these uh, various links so that you can find them all. There was also a link shared by Usman Ngo from uh, Senegal, I guess, about a survey that is conducted, uh, that is currently being conducted on to evaluate the need of space uh, assets in Africa. So this has general uh, questionnaires, but I obviously invite all the meteorological and climatological communities in Africa to uh, answer these questionnaires and uh, make uh, African Union commissions and uh, various decision makers know about the needs of the meteorological communities on satellite questions. I would like before to conclude this session, speak one question that appears in the chat from uh, Joran Luther from the European Commission. And this question is for you, Zachary. Uh, so if you are still in the room, Zachary, the question is as follows. Who are the users of the early warning issued by the IDOC? Uh, IPAC, I think, uh, given that AUC is also setting a situation room operation center, and given that warning are issued also at national level. Or for what do they use this information? Or is it linked to the situation rooms at AUC and other regional situation rooms like the one presented by ACMAD? Uh, Zachary, could you pick this question and provide uh, a live answer? You. Yes, thank you, Vincent. Uh, is that uh, the, the, the disaster operations rooms are linked 
the one with at Ike Park, the one in uh, Akimad, and the one at uh, African Union. Uh, there is a, a, a what consortium? What would you call it? There is a is a, a network, a network. Uh, so when we produce this uh, bulletin, we said we 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 produce for African Union, the African wide like drought, uh, no the flood. Uh, early warning, the, the bulletin is uh, uh, fed into the African Union. The countries also are using the information. They can uh, go to our situation room and use the information because we are linked with the, the focal point in the countries. So we work in, uh, in, uh, in collaboration. The national focal point, regional focal point, and they also at the African Union as a team collaborative is a network i don't know whether i have answered the question yes thank you and uh, also for your own uh, this afternoon we'll have also a presentation from uh, south africa weather service which will speak a little bit about how they uh, do uh, no casting at regional level and how they link up with uh, national uh, entities because obviously uh, alarm and alerts are uh, done at national level. So if sometimes capacities can be regionalized in order to serve all countries, it's very important in, indeed that the link between regional centers and national authorities responsible for giving a warning and alert are very well uh, conceptualized and put into uh, practice. So thank you for this question. I would not, because we are already quite late, so I would like to conclude these first sessions, uh, I would like to thank all the presenters and all the participants uh, for your active uh, participation uh, through your presentation and through the chat and the question and answer. There are still a few open questions. We'll take the time to answer them uh, in written. And we see you all back in one hour, 30 minutes for uh, some uh, the second sessions, which will be a bit more practical, focusing on uh, some of the tools, uh, notably the no casting stuff and some additional concrete example, but also uh, looking at the future with, uh, no, with the Metosat third generation uh, that will uh, be launched at the end of this year and how this might uh, influence uh, the uh, future of forecasting and no casting in Africa uh, and obviously also uh, how we can ensure a smooth transitions between uh, the current Metosat second generation and Metosat third generation, um, because there is need for uh, some support, obviously, to ensure this transition, notably on the aspect related to accessing the satellite data, because MTG will offer much more data than uh, Metosat second generation. So we'll also touch Uh, this subject this afternoon. Voilà, merci beaucoup. Merci aussi aux traducteurs de nous avoir accompagnés ce matin. Et on se retrouve dans uh, une heure et demie uh, pour uh, la deuxième session. Merci beaucoup et à très bientôt. The, the Zoom session will stay connected. So you can stay connected or you can reconnect uh, in about one hour, 30 minutes time to join the second session as you prefer. Thank you. Uh, bon appétit for those who have a lunch break now or have a good break and see you very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much.
John.
Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon, Yusuf. Yeah, I'm back. Good afternoon. Yeah, you're welcome. We're still live now, so I will take the floor in uh, three minutes uh, to start the session two. Africa can cause a lot of hardship to people, like floods and storms. Climate change is projecting that there will be an increase in the intensity and frequency of storms. That's what everybody is concerned about. Having that information means we should do something about it. We need to see how the weather information can be used effectively to reduce the observed impact. The SWIFT project is a science for weather information and forecasting techniques. We're working very much all the time with the national weather services in the African countries to support their science, their forecasting skills, their ability to interpret models and data and their measurement tools and their communication channels through to users. That will help the community, but also policymakers will be getting information that will assist them to use weather information, build a resilience community due to weather-related hazards. And the feedback is that this saves, saves lives. Across tropical Africa, intense rainfall events are disruptive and damaging to agriculture and can be especially devastating for smallholder farmers. An unanticipated storm could ruin a crop left out to dry. Unexpectedly heavy rainfall could disrupt the transport of produce to market. Climate change is projecting that there will be an increase in the intensity and frequency of storms. That's what everybody is concerned about. Having that information means we should do something about it. Numerical weather models to predict these events are constantly evolving and improving, but the skill of these models for the prediction of high-impact rainfall events remains fairly low across tropical Africa. Real-time observations to visualise and monitor high-impact rainfall events can provide more accurate information. Observations can even be used to make an estimation of a storm path over the next few hours. This is now casting and is the latest frontier in weather prediction in tropical Africa. While some countries have the luxury of radars for monitoring ongoing storms, 
many in the developing world do not. Through the Global Challenges Research Fund, African SWIFT project, scientists have instead been investigating and applying the use of satellite images for now casting over Africa, and this has been done with great success. Satellite is an important resource. The satellites above Africa are very high quality, some of the best in the world, and they produce enormous amounts of data which hasn't really been exploited as well as it can be to, to get information to people. So FASTER, the Forecasting African Storms application, based at the University of Leeds, is taking cutting-edge research from the SWIFT project and transforming it into a practical solution. By extracting information from satellite data provided by UMATSAP, FASTER will make now casting information available via an application programming interface, or API. We will now demonstrate our beta version of the API. Here we have the rapidly developing Thunderstorm product, which outlines storm objects identified by the UMETSAT NWC SAF algorithm. Given the user's location, storm objects within a given radius are retrieved from the FASTER database. The colours show whether the storms have been categorised as growing, mature or decaying. We can also see the previous storm track in grey and a projected path 1.5 hours into the future in black. The convective rainfall rate product gives an estimate of rainfall rate associated with storm regions. For both products, data is available in near real time every 15 minutes and previous time steps can be viewed by adjusting the slider or by playing the animation. Future projections of storm motion can also be viewed. The way in which the storm data is stored in the FASTER database allows for high flexibility in its display and utility. One example is the ability for push alerts if a storm is projected to reach the user. For small-scale farmers, the improved accuracy of this information relative to 24 to 48 hour forecasts could have huge impacts. Warning of an approaching storm could provide time to cover crops left to dry before the rain arrives. They could delay the spraying of pesticides to prevent the expensive chemicals being washed away. Also, they could adjust the transportation schedule to avoid disruption on the roads. We are pleased to begin piloting this project in Kenya in partnership with the Kenya Meteorological Department. The ubiquitous availability of satellite data means that FASTA could be made available anywhere in tropical Africa or even further afield. FASTA is keen to partner with African initiatives to explore the utility of now casting and harness the data in the most impactful way. Good afternoon, everybody. Bonjour à nouveau. Bienvenue. Hope you had a good rest and break between the two sessions and uh, happy to see you back here. So this morning we reached about 200, 220 even uh, participants to this webinar. Uh, this afternoon session will be a little bit more uh, technical, focusing on the tools to um, do no casting in Africa, but also projecting us uh, in, the, in the future. And uh, we will actually start uh, this afternoon session with a presentation from Natasha about uh, the impact of the new Meteosat third generation uh, for no casting in Africa and related uh, main uh, challenges. But before I give the floor to Natasha, I would like also to uh, indicate to you that the polls, there is a new polls answer, so take the time to answer this, uh, these questions. If you would like to chat with the audience or with us, you can use the chat functions. But if you would like to raise some questions to the presenters, then please use the Q&A uh, button on the bottom of the screen. Um, you will see also that in the Q&A sections, you have actually uh, three, uh, two types, the open question and the answered one. So, uh, for those of you who have posted some questions this morning, uh, some of them might not have been answered live, but you will see a written answer to your question in this um, tab of answered questions. And we will address the open questions uh, during the course of this uh, second session. So, uh, 
without further ado, I would like now to pass the floor to Natasha for uh, the first presentation of the afternoon. So, Natasha, I let you share your screen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent, for the introduction. I hope that you can see my screen. Yes. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon, all. Um, as Vincent already announced, uh, I will try to give you a brief introduction into our next generation geostationary satellite, Meteosat third generation, and uh, to talk a little bit about the benefits that are expected from the new geostationary mission, especially with regards to now casting, as we today already heard a lot of uh, about how the satellite data are applied in now casting procedures. And we saw many nice examples of, of the data being used operationally, but let us now look a little bit in, in the future and see what the MTG will bring in, in that sense. So MTG will consist of imagery and sounding satellites. So I will touch upon uh, each of the missions and a little bit about the benefits and challenges we can expect uh, in the upcoming years. In the next generation Meteosat satellite imagery mission, we, uh, it will be provided by MTGI satellites. Uh, in each group of satellites, there will be uh, two of the imager satellites, uh, and the imager satellite will carry two main instruments. Um, it will be flexible combined imager, and uh, which will actually be a successor of current severe imager, and the new lightning imager. A uh, flexible combined imager on MTG I1 satellite will provide full disk uh, images every 10 minutes in 16 spectral bands, whereas the FCI on the second satellite, MTG I2, once it will be launched, it will provide rapid scanning images uh, every 2.5 minutes over Europe and North Africa. So the temporal resolution of the new data will be better. It will enable more frequent imaging than the current satellites. When it comes to spectral and spatial resolution, currently we have severe imager with 12 channels, as you can see in this image. So we have four channels in solar and eight in the thermal part of spectrum with current severe imager. And uh, most of the channels have the resolution three, three kilometer per pixel. The next generation uh, imager FCI will have 16 uh, spectral channels, eight in the solar part of spectrum and eight in the thermal part. So the largest change from current uh, severe images to, to uh, imager to, to the FCI will be in the solar part of spectrum. All solar channels will have uh, at least one kilometer spatial resolution and two of them, 0 0.6 and 2.2, will have 500 meter resolution. So much better spatial resolution than the current imagery. The thermal channels will remain uh, pretty similar to current infrared channels, uh, but they will have higher spatial resolution than currently available. Channels 3.8 and 10.5 will have one kilometer resolution and the rest of the channels will have two kilometer resolution. So that is the change that we expect with the next generation imager. As we already mentioned, these 16 channels that we saw will be scanned every 10 minutes full disk. And then once the, um, once the rapid scanning satellite will be launched, uh, the, the upper third of the, of the disk will be scanned in 2.5 uh, minute intervals. Uh, the, the applications benefiting from a flexible combined imager will be detection of rapid atmospheric processes, such as severe convective storms. Also monitoring of clouds, dust outbreaks, aerosols, fires, land surface changes, and the range of other phenomena will be important application areas of the flexible combined imager data. For example, in convective situations, when thunderstorms are developing, better spatial resolution of FCI images will, will enable more detailed analysis of the storm top uh, structure and the features on top of the convective storms. You can see here the difference between the future one kilometer resolution and the current view with three kilometer resolution uh, of the convective storms. As some of the features appearing on top of these severe, uh, severe convective storms 
um, have been connected to uh, or have been an indicator of severe weather manifestations, like, for example, large hail or heavy rain, a more detailed analysis and monitoring of, of these features, such as overshooting tops or these cold ring areas, for example, will enable more timely nowcast and warnings of severe weather occurrence. Another important application that will benefit from higher spatial resolution will be the detection of fog areas and the monitoring and of the development and decay of the fog will, be, uh, will benefit also from higher temporal resolution. We can see here uh, an example of how, for example, fog, especially in the narrow valleys, is seen now and how it will be seen in the future with, with MPG. This uh, application will help in particular air traffic and airport operations application. One kilometer resolution of 3.8 and 10.5 micron images will enable better ability of fire detection. Since as you can see here, much smaller fires will be detectable uh, in the future than they are with the current severity imager. Together with better temporal resolution, this will provide a powerful tool in detecting and fighting fires, also detecting smoke and mapping fire burnt areas. So fire detection and monitoring will be one of the very important applications. When we talk about RGBs, the new, new RGBs, um, the five new channels in solar part of spectrum will enable production of several new daytime RGB products which will find their use in now casting procedures more certainly. For example, through color RGB that will be used for cloud analysis, aerosol detection, but also monitoring of ocean color and vegetation. Then cloud phase RGB, which will utilize the characteristics of new 2.2 micron channel. It will enable distinction, distinction of the cloud phase, uh, but also defer particle size. So it will enable seeing clouds with small light particles on top, which, which uh, is uh, usually an indicator of rapid storm development as, as Vesa was showing in the morning. And uh, this cloud phase RGB will then enable monitoring also storm severity, which can be crucial in the now casting process. Similar can also be done with cloud type RGB, which will differ various cloud types, uh, but also snow and ice, and uh, it will uh, it, and can also be used for vegetation monitoring. And finally, together with already existing 3.9 and 1.6 micron channels that we have on Severi, a new near infrared 2.2 micron channel will enable creation of fire temperature RGB. So we will have an important product for monitoring of fires of the open space with the next generation imager. MTGI satellites will, together with FCI, carry also a new instrument, a lightning imager, which does not have a, a predecessor uh, on the uh, Metasat second generation. I believe I don't have to mention how important monitoring of lightning activities is in, in following and forecasting the development of thunderstorms. So when we look at the annual density of, of lightning strokes, we see that the highest frequency is found in tropical and subtropical Africa. And when you compare this to the coverage of the four cameras of lightning imager, then you see that the area of highest lightning activity will be fully covered by the instrument, the lightning imager instrument. This will add particular value to the detecting and monitoring convective storms in otherwise data sparse areas, such as over the oceans and the parts of, of Africa. Uh, this will be an important data source for thunderstorm now casting in Africa. When you look at the data, what it will look like, the loop shows uh, what the lightning imager data could look like. This is an example from the already existing GOES, American GOES satellite. The now casting applications that will benefit from lightning images will be monitoring of convective storms. And this will be beneficial for issuing weather warnings and weather alerts for providing information to weather sensitive economic sectors such as aviation. So a very important applications of lightning imager data are expected. Besides the imager satellite, the next generation of uh, Meteosat satellites will also have a sounding satellite. The sounding satellite will carry an infrared sounder that will provide hyperspectral infrared uh, sounding mission. 
this kind of instruments are currently not available in the geostationary orbit. So this will be the first time that we will have the infrared sounding mission in geostationary orbit. And besides the infrared sounder, the sounding satellite will also carry a U U ultraviolet uh, instrument for air quality monitoring. The infrared sounder will deliver operational uh, spectral imagery with high spatial, spectral, and temporal resolution, actually unprecedented spatial and temporal, temporal resolution, as we currently have it only on, on polar satellites. The Earth disk will be covered in four local area coverage zones, and LAC4, which covers Europe and northern part of Africa, will be revisited or scanned every 30 minutes, and the other three uh, areas will be scanned in between. So actually, you will have, have very frequent, very frequent uh, information about the vertical structure of the atmosphere from this infrared sounding. The spatial resolution will be four kilometers at Nadir, so very high spectral resolution. What, we, what you will get from the data are profiles of temperature and humidity and also wind, which will provide a 4D view of thermodynamic structure of the atmosphere. And this will be an important data source for the assimilation in the numerical models, but also a very important now casting tool. Uh, infrared sounding data will enable filling large spatial and temporal gaps that we currently have in this standard 12 hourly radio sound observations. And, and this data will be very important for NWP models, but they will also ensure better the depiction of the hydrological cycle in the, in the numerical models. What will be important for now casting will be this four dimensional, dimensional information on humidity, temperature, and wind, so-called 4D weather cube. And uh, it will support now casting applications by detecting pre-convective situations. So we will be able to derive Reconvective uh, indexes and parameters that will show the ability of atmosphere to produce convective, um, convective development and also convective initiation uh, products will be enabled. And this will give rise to, to improved warnings on location and intensity of convective storms. Information of, on, on vertically resolved atmospheric motion vectors with improved height assignment will be very beneficial for the tropical areas. The data from IRS will also, also enable forecasting pollution and monitoring the atmospheric trace gases and um, also improved volcanic ash prediction. So this is, these are the main applications and benefits from the infrared sound emission. And when can we expect all this new data? As already mentioned in the beginning by our Director General, the first of the series, MTGI satellite, MTGI-1, will, will be launched in mid-December this year. And we already expect by the end of the next year, the operational use of the data. The first sounder satellite, MTGS-1, will be launched beginning of 2024. And then the, the next I-1, which will provide the rapid scanning imagery, will be launched somewhere in the second half of 2025. And what are the challenges? Um, well, the main thing, due to the limited bandwidth on the Umidcast Africa, all FCI channels will not be disseminated in full temporal and spatial resolution, as you can see in this table. Uh, however, there will be other means of access accessing those data. And this will be ex explained also in one of the next uh, presentations. So, so stay, stay tuned. Uh, there will be uh, a range of products, like for example, uh, RGB products centrally produced by UMATSAT and disseminated through UMATCAST Africa. There will also be some now casting products centrally produced and disseminated, and uh, more about now casting soft products and um, the plans for the next generation uh, product uh, development you will hear in the following presentation. And what is important also to say that lightning accumulated, lightning imager accumulated flash area data will be disseminated in the native format uh, on UMATCAST Africa. In order to ensure the timely preparation of the forecasters uh, for using the data in products from the next generation satellites, UMATSAT will, as until now, also in the future support African partners and centers of excellence in the user training. 
which was uh, what was already announced by Monsan uh, is the training that is planned from 2nd May to 3rd June satellite application course, which is going to be delivered this year again online in English and French in parallel. The applications for the training are already open on the, on, on the UMATSAT training webpage and the letters of invitation uh, to PRs will be sent uh, any day now. What I also have to mention is, of course, ASMET Africa, where you have a lot of online training resources, case studies, etc. And we already heard a lot about the SWIFT project, which, which uh, also enables, besides uh, beside partnering and, and uh, other um, activities, also training, collaboration, and a tool that enables uh, practical use of satellite products in a testbed environment. Uh, for any questions, user service help desk of UMATSAT is always at your disposal. And to conclude, uh, I need to emphasize that the launch of MPG presents the real opportunity to improve and enhance the applications of um, satellite data and now casting and all the downstream applications like civil protection, disaster risk, risk reduction, agriculture, food production, health, and many others. So because all these and because of all these key uh, applications that we are hoping for, we are impatiently waiting to see all the capabilities of the Meteor Set third generation. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Merci, Natasha. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Uh, I would like just to pick one. There was one open question. There is several ones, but I will just pick one. There was one question uh, from uh, Lionel about the availability of simulated MTG images. Could you just provide a quick answer to that one? If there is any simulated uh, on the, MTG. Yeah. On the, uh, so we are currently using um, uh, Images, images from other satellites that have similar channels, for example, like GOES satellite or some channels of Himavari, some from the polar satellites. But there is there are test data available on the UMATSAT webpage. We can provide later on. I have to search for, for the right link. But there is test data for the MPG uh, to be uh, used for preparation um, available on our um, webpage. Thank you, Natasha. We can post the link in the yeah. in typing the answer uh, in the Q and A sessions. There was some other question about the soft products under MTG, and this question is very uh, uh, pertinent because the, for the next presentation, because we'll have now a presentation from Xavier Calbet from the Spanish Meteorological Services. Uh, who is running, uh, is leading the, the, the no-casting SAF uh, software, satellite application facilities. So I would like to pass the floor to Javier uh, for a presentation of this uh, software. We have heard a lot about it also this morning and uh, about the current and the future expected products. So Javier, the floor is yours. Um, Thank, thank you, Vincent. Um, I'll try to share my screen here, see if it works. Uh, desktop, share, presentation. Is it working? Yes, very well. Okay, so my name is Xavier Calvet. I, I'm the now casting staff scientific coordinator, and I'm making this presentation on behalf of Pilar Ripodas, who's the now, cast, now casting staff project manager. So I will talk about a bit about the products and what what we do and what what can be done with with um, the now casting stuff. Okay, um, so first, explain a little bit what is the EOMESAT SAF network. So SAF stands for Satellite Application Facilities, and they are um, SAFs are located within the National Metro. Let me close here a window, otherwise I can't see well. Um, the SAFs are located within the National Meteorological Services of AOMESAT member states or, or other agreed entities linked to a user community. And they provide products for AOMESAT, and it's a way to generate products um, decentralized from the AOMESAT headquarters. And you can see that there are different specialized SAFs. You can see them here. 
So for example, you have atmospheric compositions up, up here at the top left, um, ocean SAF, uh, radio occultation SAF, hydrology SAF, and now castings have here in the bottom left. Also, you have the land SAF here in the top right. You can look at more information here in this link if you're interested. So in, in this presentation, we will just exclusively talk about the now casting SAF. And here in this slide, I try to express what the now casting SAF concept is. Um, the now casting SAF concept is to ensure the optimum use of meteorological satellite data in now casting and very short range forecasting. And what we do is we, we um, distribute software packages. So we do not distribute products like other um, SAFs do, we distribute software. And the idea is for the users to select a region, um, usually relatively small compared to the whole globe, where you can do your now casting and you generate the products for this specific region. And the idea is to generate them very quickly, um, such as they're, that they're useful for, for now casting. Um, there are two software packages, one for geostationary satellites and another one for polar satellites. And we also provide user supports and training. So here's a broader view of the two software packages we deliver, one for geostationary satellites, another one for polar satellites. The GEO software is called GEO and the polar satellite one is called PPS. And you can see here the different um, satellites that um, are used in, in particular for the GEO version. You can see we, we can use MSG, data, but also other satellites like Himawari 8, GOES N, and GOES 16. Um, current night casting soft products for geostationary satellites. Um, oh yeah, these are the list of products that we generate for geostationary satellites. You can see there's a wide range of products, um, different products. I'll just concentrate on the um, um, on the classes that you can produce. So you can you can produce cloud products, cloud mass, cloud type, etc. You can produce precipitation products. We have several of those. Also, stability products, which um, try to estimate the stability indices in the in the atmosphere. Convection products. One of them is the RDT, which we've seen plenty today. Another one is convective initiation um, to estimate whether a cloud will become a storm or not. Um, winds, you can also have high, high resolution winds. Image extrapolation, you can, you can extrapolate some images and some NWC SAF products into the future to see how they evolve um, and do some now casting with it. And then some automatic Im image interpretation products, um, triple pass folding, which is useful for for um, turbulence, detecting turbulence for, for aviation, and GW product, which is gravity waves, it detects gravity waves, also useful for aviation. So here's a, um, um, say, image, imagery overview of the different products. You can have more information in the website. And we will see, and these are the, the polar products. Um, you can see in polar products, you have cloud products. Um, cloud type, cloud top temperature and height and so on, and also precipitation products, um, probability of precipitation. And then we have um, now, the now casting SAF services. So you have the, 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 what we call the tickets, which is the user service. So you place a ticket there and we try to answer um, to your request. You can download the software. We have guide to software to forecasters and we have um, an aviation guide also. So um, how to run the, the geo software at your site? You have to register as a user. It is free and can be done online. You download the software from the website. You install the software. You set the configuration of your interest, in particular the satellite you want to use, the products to be generated, and the area. And then you have to feed it with the input data needed. This is usually the most complicated step in all this setup. So to have the line feeds set up. So in particular, the, the MSG or MTG in the future 
um, satellite files, and then our Mercury model um, is also needed for, for the products. Um, we can use, and then our casting sub software can use either ECMWF or GFS model. And then, as I said before, we, we offer support, user support, and the software can be run operationally in near real time. And, but also you can generate the products in offline mode. So here are some examples. Um, here to the left, um, you have the cloud type, which is a very colorful image as you can see, and it just um, color codes the different cloud types you can find in, a, in, in the atmosphere. And then on the top right, you have the cloud top pressure, which can be um, shown either in, in ectopascals or pascals in this case, or in temperature range. So that, that would be the, the, height, the height of the top of the cloud. You also have the high resolution winds, which are depicted here um, with this barbs um, um, graph, and you can see them overlaid on top of the uh, infrared image here. And then you have the rapid developing thunderstorm, which you've seen of plenty today. So it, it tracks convective cells. Um, it locates and tracks convective cells. And then you have the convective rainfall intensity, which we've also seen today. And the convective, another, we have two kinds of convective rainfall intensity. Um, one which we call CRR and the other one which we call CRRPH. So PR, CRRPH is supposed to be better in the future and, and supersede the CRR product. And then um, we're working also um, a little bit with the, with the visualization of the products. We're using a, a software that it's called Atagook. It's um, generated by KNMI. The nice thing about Atagook is that it is free software and you can set up a server to serve the products um, on, on, a, on a web server and then you can visualize it with a, with a web browser easily. Um, it's relatively easy to set up and you, you can, it works quite well, quite nicely. Here you can see the RDT product overlaid with the, with the wind product. Okay, and future plans. So we would like to adapt, um, or we, we have adapted and we will continue adapting um, the products to the new MSAT satellites. So in particular, MTGI, MTGS, and, and EPS second generation satellites, ensuring continuity. And um, we will try to exploit fully the capabilities of the new satellites, improving current products and generating new products. Um, the LI instrument is, an, is a particular interesting one, which you've seen before. And then we will also have some IRS products um, indicating instability, as Natasha mentioned before, and some um, um, EPS-based products on microwave and, 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 and also some um, ice, ice determination products for the ice, ice clouds, icing in clouds. And, okay. So um, in, regarding the African dissemination, um, the baseline now for MTG is that there will be two ways to obtain the now casting soft products. When I mean the products, I'm talking about the net CDF4 files. So not, not images, but the files themselves directly. And one way to obtain them is uh, you can have all the now casting soft products. Um, generating them locally, like we've described before, uh, but you will have to receive the data via EOMECAST terrestrial. And um, via EOMECAST um, satellite, you will have a few selection of products, which are the star products, so to speak, and which is the RDT, the um, um, rainfall rate, and some cloud products. And also will be disseminated some rain estimates from the other SAF, the hydrology SAF, which is called H03B. And this can also be useful for users in, in Africa. And this is all. Thank you for your attention. If you want more information, you have the website here and you have Pilar's email here, Pilar Ripota's emails down here. 
on the gen generic um, now casting self email here. Thank you very much. Gracias, Javier. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Merci beaucoup. So um, we started the afternoon very well. As you have seen, uh, this no casting stuff uh, was mentioned several times uh, this morning in the various uh, presentation. I know you have all the link to be able to uh, find more information on this uh, software. And also, as we have seen this morning, thanks to the SWIFT project has demonstrated that it's possible today to run the no casting stuff in Africa and to uh, use it uh, using the UMEDCAST Africa uh, channel that receive all the MSG data. We have seen also that with MTG, uh, there will be much more new product and the no casting SAF will be adapted also to this new uh, MTG product. But there, is, there will be some issues, there might be some issues for um, some users in Africa to get all the data from the Metosat third generation. That's why now we will go to the next presentation, which will present a potential uh, approach for the future where uh, there will be some shared, I would say, uh, processing burden between regional centers and national uh, med services. And uh, thanks to the WMO severe weather events and other projects, the South Africa Weather Service has already experimented um, this type of uh, link between regional and national um, authorities for no casting purposes. And I'm pleased to uh, welcome Morne Gibbons from uh, the South Africa Weather Service to present us what has been achieved so far in the southern part of Africa. So uh, Morne, the floor is yours. If you can share Thank your you screen. Thank you very much. Uh, can you see my screen? Can you yes. see it? It's, it's visible, thanks. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so yes, I'm Morna Geiben from the South African Weather Service. Uh, and today I'll just speak a little bit about the regional approach to now casting that uh, we have explored in Southern Africa. So the, I'm just gonna touch on some background on the South African Weather Service as an entity as well as a WMO Regional Specialized Meteorological Center. Then I'm gonna to move to the Severe Weather Forecasting Program from the WMO, uh, which was previously the Severe Weather Forecasting Demonstration Project, uh, where the actual now casting uh, approach for Southern Africa was started. And then I'm just gonna give some final plans and conclusions. So just to start with the South African Weather Service. Uh, so we're the National Meteorological Center of South Africa. Uh, we're a public entity in terms of the South African Weather Service Act um, of 2001, which was amended in 2013. And of course, we have the mandate uh, from the state to provide weather and climate information, products and services, um, as well as contribute to the safety of life and property uh, in the air, the land, as well as the uh, sea uh, over the South Africa region and the adjacent oceans. So in, this, uh, in South Africa, we're very fortunate to have a quite extensive observation network. So as you can see in this map, we have uh, many uh, observations coming from automatic weather stations, and rainfall stations, uh, some climate stations, etc. And then we also are Fortunate to have an extensive weather radar network. Uh, currently, we have 12 radars across South Africa, which is soon to be 14. So this is quite useful for on our casting in South Africa. We also have a regional lightning detection network that covers uh, the entire South Africa. And then, of course, the satellite information that we receive from UMITSAT. And we also run regional numerical weather prediction models. So. We're in a very fortunate position in South Africa to perform now casting. This is just to show some of the radar products where we can uh, 
monitor intense thunderstorms uh, for now cast the hail. Uh, we can track thunderstorms for the next two hours. We also have satellite products available as well as uh, lightning products. Uh, so for example, a lightning uh, warning system for a specific point. And we also went into further applications of developing impact-based forecasts or rather impact-based now costs where we, uh, for example, for the aviation industry, uh, try to use radar information to try and predict the number of delays, reduce rates and stoppages at the airport. But this is also very nice for South Africa, but um, the South African Weather Service is also a WMO Regional Specialized Meteorological Center, or R RSMC, uh, and we're also responsible for assisting uh, all our neighboring countries in Southern Africa as well with uh, now casting activities. So just to give a, a definition, a regional specialized meteorological center is responsible for the distribution of information advisories and warnings for one or more specific weather types in a defined geographical area of responsibility. Um, and basically what we do is we interpret information from global centers. We prepare daily guidance products uh, up to five days ahead. Uh, that we can distribute to national met services. Uh, and we also maintain the regional website. So the RSMC in Pretoria um, therefore provides uh, products for meteorological services in the Southern African Development Community or Southern Africa. Then we are also the lead for the severe weather forecasting program um, from the WMO for Southern Africa. And uh, this severe weather forecasting program aims to strengthen national met and hydrological services in developing countries, as well as least developed countries um, and small island developing countries to deliver improved forecast and warnings of severe weather in order to save lives livelihoods. So initially this program started off as a severe weather forecasting demonstration project, but only five countries uh, that was involved in this project. And due to the success, it was later in 2009 extended to 16 countries in Southern Africa. And then just more recently in June 2009, WMO uh, decided to drop the demonstration designation of this program to make it a, a severe weather forecasting program. So of course in Southern Africa we also then became known as the South African uh, Southern African uh, after severe weather forecasting program sorry. So just to mention in this uh, program it makes use of the cascading forecasting process um, where global centers provide various numerical weather prediction, products and services, including ensemble prediction systems, uh, as well as satellite observations. This is then passed over to a regional center, um, which prepared guidance forecasts, uh, refined products with regional models, as well as add now casting products as well. And then this information is uh, distributed to the various national meteorological centers which in turn then provides uh, alerts and warnings to disaster management centers. So in South Africa, uh, we have the responsibility to be, as the RSMC, uh, to receive the information from global centers and then basically prepare some guidance uh, forecasts and also refine the products uh, with our regional models and med services, which then, then have to basically uh, look at all this information that we send them, and then they can use it to uh, send out alerts. So just to mention that uh, currently we receive information from various uh, global modeling centers, such as the UK Met Office, ECNWF, uh, NSET from NOAA, uh, Meteo France for tropical cyclone support, and then of course, you met that for satellite uh, 
information. So from the South African weather side, uh, we also make extra contributions by with our regional model forecasts, uh, our now costing products, and the issuing of guidance products. So just to also mention that uh, the most important things we use for our now casting services is the satellite data, uh, which we receive from UMITSAT for the full disk. Um, this is all 12 channels every 15 minutes. And then at the South African Weather Service, we also have a supercomputer where we run our own uh, regional model, which is based on the unified model from the UK Met Office. So as you can see, for the entire Southern Africa, we run a 4.4 kilometer resolution model uh, with four times daily. Um, and two of the runs are for 72 hours ahead, and the other two for uh, one for 40 hour, 48 hours ahead, and the other for 60 hours ahead. So then what we do is we uh, analyze the global modeling products as well as the regional products and make this available to other African med services. We also forecast this these guidance forecasts uh, for next five days. So this is an example of day one. So it provides information of where severe rainfall in the next 24 hours. And this is, of course, also very important for the start of an outcast. Test the short range forecast and also identify areas where high impact weather is likely to occur. So we're forecasting and focus their attention. Then we also use satellite and numerical weather prediction data for very short range forecast for the next few hours. Um, and basically products uh, as uh, higher resolution compared to the global models. And of course, this can also add additional value by creating, for example, regional instability indices instead of global instability indices. Then of course, we also do various outcasting activities based on the satellite data. But most of these products are also blended with our regional models. Um, and then after we've created the products, we create output images, which we can then supply to national meteorological services. So it's just an example of a rainfall product where we uh, estimate the rainfall. And then we also apply uh, now casting tracking algorithms to uh, now cause the movement of these cells. And just to also mention, of course, we can also then customize products uh, if requested by the med services. We also run the now costing satellite application facility software locally at the, the weather service. Um, so we feed the satellite information into the system as well as our regional numerical weather prediction model on the 4.4 kilometer resolution. And then we also feed our lightning information into the system. But of course the lightning information is more relevant for South Africa and some of the neighboring countries uh, where there's still some lightning information. And then we create the now costing SAF products for the entire SADC domain. Um, with the exception of a few areas here over the Indian Ocean including Madagascar, which, which I'll say something about a bit, a bit later. So this is just an example of the type of product. So I'm also going to display the rapidly developing thunderstorm product. So of course, we plot this in various displays, so overlaying it on satellite images. We also plot it on an interactive Google map. So uh, since we cover such a big area, it's... Uh, nice for a forecaster to zoom in and then they can also click on a certain storm to get various information about the storm. So in terms of dissemination, so currently we are then disseminating these products on the RSMC webpage of Pretoria. And this is of course quite useful because you 
you don't require any complex technology. So we can create the products at the weather service and then uh, supply this to med services without them requiring to actually run the various softwares uh, available. So just to look at some future plans, um, we're currently involved with the WMO Climate Risk and Early Warning Services Project for the Southwest Indian Ocean States. And one of the deliverables of this project is to expand the now casting products uh, to the um, some of the Indian Ocean uh, uh, countries such as uh, Madagascar, which is not covered currently, so, uh, certain parts of Madagascar, also the Comoros, Mauritius, as well as the Seychelles. So in the next uh, year or so, we will have some products for them as well. And then another thing is we're also going to update uh, the RSMC website in the next coming months. And this is uh, much needed because it's uh, quite an old website and uh, it is in desperate need of revamping. And there's also several new products that uh, we still need to add to this website uh, as well. Then, of course, we also will continue to sustain the operations at the South African Weather Service, um, develop new products, and also we're looking forward to the Meteosat third generation satellite to uh, create improved products uh, for the region. And then ultimately, we also aim to provide op operational support for multi hazard early warning systems in the region. So, this is one of the aims that we're looking into. So just to uh, conclude, the severe weather forecasting program in Southern Africa uh, has already demonstrated how regional centers can assist countries, uh, firstly with guidance products, with uh, modeling products, and then also the now casting products. Um, and I've also said that regional centers can also add additional value to now casting products, uh, for example, including the regional models. Uh, with high resolution um, and it's also a nice case where regional centers can take on the responsibility to receive the data sets uh, from global centers also process this data create products and services and then just supply this information to national med services uh, through a website and this is also a nice motivation that uh, we can maybe look into establishing regional now casting hubs across South Af across Africa, um, which can lessen the burden of the big data uh, flows that's that's needed. And of course, finally, we should also start looking at supporting multiple sectors of society by uh, providing customized now casting services. Uh, by means of multi as that's my presentation. Thank you, Mornay. Thanks for this uh, presentation. First part presenting the no casting operations in South Africa, and then uh, your uh, operation as regional centers and how you uh, compute some of the no casting product for the entire region. I would like before we pass to the next presentation, just to pick uh, two or three questions that relates to the uh, two first presentation. Uh, there is one from Samuel Hansa about what is the computer specification for installing the no casting soft, uh, software and running it. So I don't know if uh, Javier or Mornay, you could uh, take the floor and respond live to this question. Yeah, I, I don't remember the exact figures, but it's a relatively normal PC. Um, if you want to run a, say, relatively reasonable size, say, country size, medium country size uh, area. If you want a larger area, you need a, power, a more powerful PC, but you don't need a lot of computing power um, when you compare with the, with the current PCs you have today. Okay. Thank you, Javier. So this is really, uh, I don't know if Mornay, you have any complementary, uh, maybe referring to your specific case to cover the, the Southern African region. Which type of computer uh, are you using for running the non-casting stuff? 
Yeah, so currently it's it's a very simple system. Uh, it's uh, just a Intel Core i7 processor that we're running. Um, and, then, and then, of course, it needs a, a Linux uh, operating system installed to run the system. So it's, it's just a, a simple i7 processor uh, with about 52 gigabytes of memory and uh, 512 gigs of storage currently. Très bien. Il y a une autre question qui a été répondue, mais qui est aussi sur le, le no casting SAF. Euh, pour Javier, euh, j'ai pu installer no, no casting SAF sur mon PC, mais j'aimerais savoir comment on l'utilise. Uh, can you maybe answer to that so that the interpretation can also interpret your answer into French? Yeah, um, we can help you with the installation. Um, so just um, post a, um, a ticket in the help desk and we can help you with that. Um, uh, as I answered in the questions and answer, um, the most difficult part is not installing this for near real time, okay? For near real time. The most difficult part is not installing the software, but it's setting up the line, the data feeds. You have to set up the Meteosat data feeds and the NWP ECMWF or GFS data feeds. And this is something that is usually the trickiest part. Um, setting up the software and running it is relatively easy. Um, again, you don't need a huge machine to run it. And if you want to run it offline, Um, then that's easier because you download the data from the archives, AMWSAT archive or, or ECMWF archive, and you just run the software. Um, it's relatively easy to run if you know, if you know some, some Linux, but we can help you with that if, if, if needed. Thank, thank you, Javier. Uh, and we will come back on, the, on these data feeds, which indeed are very important for uh, real-time operations. And there will be later on some presentation from uh, Erdem and Youssef about uh, some potential solutions for feeding this. I would like also to mention that most of the uh, med services in sub-Saharan Africa have a Puma station that was, the last one was installed as part of the EU-funded uh, MESA project. And uh, with the Puma station, you have actually a direct access uh, to the feed. Uh, no, probably uh, there have been also some experience in using the Puma station and how to somehow feed the no casting staff software. You will probably run some parallel PCs, but you could use the PC one of the Puma station to push the data to the, to the no casting staff uh, software, certainly. Okay, um, before speaking about the data access, I would like now to pass the floor to Lorraine from the World Meteorological Organization for uh, and uh, also to, to brief us on the international efforts that are made to uh, support capacity development in no casting in Africa. So Lorraine, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you see my screen and hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, so my name is Lorraine Yavs. I'm from the World Meteorological Organization, and I'm here to present today the International Coordination for Capacity Development in Satellite-Based Nowcasting for Africa on behalf of Estelle de Koning, who is the head of the World Weather Research Program. So just to talk about the World Weather Research Program, Um, this is basically WMO's mechanism to foster and progress cooperative research for improved weather and environmental prediction services from minutes to months. So as you can see, we work across all timescales, but now casting is very much focused on the minutes to hours timescale, as was defined earlier this morning. And we really see this as an opportunity to bridge that gap and forecast provision to Africa, which is very much at the moment missing in terms of the seamless forecasting. So enabling now casting not only provides services on this timescale, but can also help initialization of longer timescale forecasts as well. So just to talk about the history and use of Meteos that second generation, um, we need the data source, which is from MSG and which is currently used. And satellite products give a really good secondary option to radar across Africa. 
So at the moment, we don't have access to many radar. Mornay commented on the use of radar in South Africa, but really there aren't many at all in the rest of sub-Saharan Africa. Currently, MSG provides data and images at about every 15 minutes. Um, and this comes through, as um, Xavier just commented, through the UMET now casting satellite applications facility led by AMET, who provide products for this application using the MSG data. And before some projects in the last few years, so both the WMO's highway project, so this is the high impact weather lake system project, and African SWIFT, which we've talked about a lot today. Um, now casting data weren't used very much across Africa. So we've seen this environment of progress and utilization of the data that's really sped up in the last five or so years. So just to talk about MTG, so meters that third generation, um, we talked about how this will be launched towards the end of this year. Um, we really see this as a fantastic opportunity to build on the work that's been done um, in those two projects, African Swift and Highway, and the fact that African countries have really said that they want their own um, African Meteorological Satellite Applications Facility, or AMSAF. So basically, African countries want to own and process that data to produce their own products. And the fact that two projects have been demonstrating the use of this, and then we have the launch of the third generation of satellites, provides this once in a lifetime opportunity to really capitalize on the work that's been done in parallel and to build something bigger. So the AMSAF declaration um, was kind of signed in, in Abidjan in 2018, and it's basically in place to encourage and support strengthening of African capacities to ensure a smooth transition to MTG. So the data were provided more frequently every 10 minutes instead of every 15, which provides another opportunity to provide more frequent updates of now casting products. In addition, there'll be a lightning imager, um, which will be on board the satellite, and this will enable more precise forecasts of severe thunderstorms, thunderstorms. And this is something which is really of crucial importance in many sub-Saharan African countries. So to move on um, to what we see as the future, and that really is the optimal use of satellite data for the provision of sustainable now casting services in Africa. Um, so what we want is for African meteorological services with a variety of different users to co-develop and deliver products to many different sectors and users across Africa to aid progress towards the UN 2030 agenda, the SDG Sustainable Development Goals, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, and for the Paris Agreement in terms of climate change adaptation. So we aim to really support the implementation of now casting services um, through building on the AMSAC concept for now casting. We believe that African meteorological service buy-in and co-design is really crucial for this endeavor to move forward. And this is something that WMO and UMETSAT and other academics from African SWIFT and people here today are really looking to do. So integrate the perspectives of different MET services and how they work with different end users to build this capacity. So at the moment, um, WMO is supporting the development of new satellite-based now casting guidelines for Africa. So these guidelines are under development. Uh, WMO already has some now casting guidelines that were produced in 2017, um, but they're not specific to any region around the world. So what we're seeing now is an opportunity to provide pros and cons, strengths and weaknesses, and the different opportunities that exist for regional developments in Africa. So the situation in Africa is, is of course, very different to other places in the world. So we want to provide this, this pathway for different regional centres across the continent to develop now casting services. We're also looking at funding sources to carry out research and demonstration projects. Um, and this is something that the guidelines will, will aid as well. So having um, something of, of an implementation plan or pathway or vision within which we can do this, in which we can get now casting services up and running will be 
very helpful in securing future funding. So at the moment, we're collaborating with different African meteorological and hydrological services, with UMITSAT and with the UMITSAT now casting SAP um, across WMO, the different departments, so the infrastructure department, the services department, and um, the WWRP, the World Weather Research Program is based in the Science Innovation Department. And we're also collaborating with some global experts and with academia. So in terms of the WMO satellite based guidelines for now casting, what we're doing is instead of providing more generic guidance um, about training and development of now casting services, which was the WMO guidelines for now casting techniques published in 2017, we're taking a cross-continental capacity development approach for the African guidelines and building on that momentum that has been developed, as I mentioned, in the highway and swift projects and through African nations in the last few years. So the guidelines aren't specifically an implementation plan, but will provide different pros and cons um, of different approaches, so different methods by which to produce products, types of training that can be implemented, and how we can, as a community, empower and enable um, African nations and meteorological services to, to develop their own now casting hubs. So as mentioned, these new guidelines will provide um, more focus and context for Africa as a continent and incorporate recent activities and developments, um, such as the standard operating procedures that were mentioned and perhaps some of the test bed activities and co-production methodologies as well. As I mentioned just earlier, we're also seeking funding to support new programs investing in climate adaptation with the aim of developing capacity building activities and ultimately sustainable now casting services across Africa. So just to go over what the guidelines will contain in terms of contents, um, here is a list of different chapters. Currently, we have eight chapters. So firstly, we start with the purpose of the guidelines. So this is really the scope. So what we're doing and what we're not doing, and what the guidelines will provide and what they aim to do. We then go into the background. So talking about why the guidelines have been developed based on that, that environment of progress that's come about in the last few years, research, uh, sorry, advancements in research development and in technology with the launch of MTG. The third chapter is focused on the observations needed for now casting services and for NWP. And then the fourth chapter, we go into um, the data skills and capacity and infrastructure needed to provide in our casting services service. So what really is essential in a MET service to be able to develop and provide now casting products. The fifth chapter is focused on um, different algorithms and methods that can be utilized to produce services and products. Um, and then the sixth chapter is about operational services. So what the operator needs to do to provide different now casting services. So that includes verification, evaluation of the product, evaluation um, through the users, the impact the products have, how they're co-produced and how they're disseminated. Chapter seven is about capacity building. So this is really focused on training of forecasters and awareness raising in different organizations. Um, it was specifically met services across Africa. So really raising the profile of impact that now casting can have across the continent to ensure that we really see lots of different met services across the continent wanting to develop their own now casting service. So the initial um, vision for these guidelines is that regional hubs across the continent will be developed in order for those regions to provide the now casting service to different countries that surround them, as SOARS are doing at the moment, and Morne um, presented that just earlier. But in future, maybe other strong MET services can come forward and they might want to also develop their own service. So this will really build on that. And then the final chapter is really about sustainability of the service. So how can we incorporate um, some public private enterprise 
how can we make sure that there's a change in institutions to incorporate now casting? So how can we ensure that across Africa, a whole continent, many countries, that institutions recognise the importance and the impact that these services can have on those policy frameworks that I mentioned, so the Paris Agreement, the SDGs, um, and also the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. So we're really looking forward to this exciting future for now casting. We're seeing this as, as really a launch, like MTG, of, of this really big initiative from Europe and, of course, across Africa, the, the really important partners in all of this and to enable this. And I'd just like to say thank you for the time and opportunity to present, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Lorraine. Merci beaucoup. Merci pour cette présentation. Euh, notamment, on retient le, le document de, de ligne directrice qui est en cours de, de préparation et qui permettra <coughs> de euh, mieux euh, documenter les points importants pour permettre à l'Afrique de, de disposer des différents outils de, pour la prévision à court terme, pour la prévision instantanée. I would like now to continue with the next set of two presentations, which is about data access for no casting. So we have seen through the <coughs> previous presentation that uh, accessing observations is one of the key uh, elements uh, for uh, no casting. So there is several types of observations, some in situ, radar, airborne, and satellites. Obviously, during this webinar, we focus a bit more on the satellite data. Uh, but and uh, for this, I would like to introduce our two next speakers. The first is Erdem Erdi from UMedsat, who will present the current ways uh, to access the satellite data and product. And we'll have also Youssef Dorman from the ASREN who will um, present us an initiative uh, which is there to facilitate um, engagement with science communities in order to get also more exchange of uh, knowledge, but also data uh, between <coughs> Europe, Africa, and within Africa. Uh, and this, was, this is also a very interesting uh, initiative, obviously, for uh, the future under the Metosat third generation. So without further ado, I would like to pass the floor to Erdem for the first presentation. So Erdem, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vincent. Um, I hope you can see my screen. Yes. Great. Um, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Arda Merdi, Data Services User Support Officer at UMetsat. So today um, I will be talking about uh, the new data services uh, which are available under the portfolio of uh, UMetsat. And then we will be checking out a few of them, including the UMetcast Terrestrial, UMetView, Data Store, and Data Tailor. So uh, UMetsat uh, has made a few new data services available and operational in the recent years. So here we can see a lot of them uh, and every one of them are, is suited for different purposes uh, for metallurgical uh, use cases. Uh, for example, you can see the GTS uh, or uh, the cloud-based uh, hosted data processing but today we will be talking about the, the uh, UMET cast terrestrial and the pool data services. So today we have heard a lot of time the importance of the satellite products uh, for now casting. Of course, to be able to benefit from those uh, data and products, uh, the forecasters first of all need to reach uh, or to have the, the data and products. So in the Current uh, case, uh, as many of us know, the, the main uh, primary dissemination, dissemination mechanism is the UMetcast satellites, uh, namely UMetcast Africa for uh, the MET services on over the African continent. And with the uh, current uh, amount of data available from MSG satellites, this uh, is working well and uh, almost all of the data that are needed by the forecasters can be distributed. But 
By the introduction of the new generation of satellites, namely MTG and EPSSG, unfortunately, the UMETCA uh, Africa Satellite Service will not be able to carry all the data in full spatial and temporal resolution. And uh, this is due to the uh, uh, largely increased amount of data and available from those satellites. And actually, this is not a challenge only for the African continent, but uh, almost all of the users uh, are, uh, are required, required to get prepared for this large amount of data and products that will be available from the next generation of satellites. So what will be the practical solutions in the next few years to, to handle uh, all this data and products? Uh, in the middle, we see the UMETCAS terrestrial. So this is the most efficient and uh, practical mean of, uh, means of uh, accessing the data in near real time. Instead of using the satellite links, the, the service uses the terrestrial links uh, available over the re research and education networks throughout the globe. And then uh, at the bottom, we can see the other mechanisms uh, which are pool data services. Uh, which are based on the internet connectivity that users can uh, view and download and tailor any data that, uh, they, that they need, again, in uh, near real-time fashion. So let's check out them uh, one by one. So UMETCAS Terrestrial, as we have mentioned, uh, rely on the network, uh, which is available throughout the globe. And uh, over the Africa, uh, many of the African countries are already connected uh, to their uh, to to the Africa Connect Three network, uh, which includes three uh, sub-regional networks. So, the 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 only uh, the, the only requirement to use UMETCAS Terrestrial is having a connection to your NREN uh, in your country. So how does it work? Uh, we can have a look uh, a, little, a little bit more detail. So uh, again, on the top, we can see the satellite service. And in the middle, we can see the terrestrial service. And on the right-hand side, we can see the reception station, which is completely identical with the satellite service, which means that uh, the, the hardware and the software uh, required to receive and process data is completely identical with the uh, satellite system. So the integration and the utilization of this service is quite straightforward. So what about the content of the UMETCAS terrestrial? Uh, it's a, a very good news is that, uh, it's a very good news is that uh, the, all the data available on the satellite service is available on the terrestrial service, plus some other large data sets which cannot be distributed over satellite service is also distributed on the terrestrial service. So it has, uh, lots and lots of data and products that UMETSAT uh, produces and distributes. Here we can see uh, the, the UMETCAS terrestrial service users around the globe. So the, uh, uh, being completely independent, independent from any satellite footprints, all those user, users can receive uh, satellite data and products in near real time. Uh, and as you can see, there are already a few uh, institutions over the African continent that are connecting, that are connected and receiving data from UMETCAS terrestrial. So the, the next data service that we will be looking at is the UMETVIEW, which is a pool data service. Uh, by visiting the view.umetsat.int, uh, you can immediately start to use this visualization service. And uh, as you can expect from uh, any GIS-based uh, visualization service or, or available over the internet, it has many uh, useful functionalities like selecting the data layers and uh, putting uh, uh, one on top of another and setting transparency, making animations, saving the images and so on. Uh, there is not enough time to mention uh, the functionalities, of course, but uh, it's, uh, you can use this service to visualize uh, and analyze satellite data and products uh, which are available on the service. And 
uh, it doesn't only contain the imagery, but it also contains the data itself that uh, you can see an example here. For example, just a case, uh, just a simple case uh, that uh, infrared imagery from MSG satellites and um, convective ray and fall rate calculated again from MSG are put together here. And then we can also see the lifted index, uh, uh, which is calculated for cloud-free areas. So this is not only useful for uh, the near real-time uh, data access, uh, which includes the recent data, but the data availability uh, goes back uh, for many years uh, that you can, uh, you can go to uh, the past date and time and uh, visualize data and products. So this was the browser uh, that you can uh, see the products, but uh, it is not only the browser or user interface available in the service, but there are also some um, WMS, WFS and WCS layer available uh, in the service uh, and uh, for automated uh, access and for further uh, downstream users or post-processing, you can automatically download the latest imagery or past imagery from this, from, uh, this service. And then you can combine this data, uh, the imagery and data for your uh, further needs in your institution or meteorological service. For example, in the, in the future, uh, you can uh, get the lightning uh, uh, flash locations from MTG and then retrieve those uh, uh, values uh, and latitudes and longitudes, geographical uh, positions, and then combine this uh, with other products to issue automated uh, or semi-automated warnings for your uh, users. The, the last uh, data service that we will, we'll, we will be looking uh, at today is the data store and data tailor. Uh, they are not the visualization service, but they are the file access services, actually. Uh, in the address of data.umetsat.int, uh, you can uh, see the catalog of available products and make search according to your uh, region of interest and date and time range. And then uh, you can download the files, the products to your computer, or you can further customize them uh, according to your needs by data tailor. Uh, so uh, here is the user interface, web user interface of data tailor that you can uh, subset, reproject, uh, change special resolution, change uh, file format and compression and so on. There are many possibilities that you can play with the data. Uh, then uh, after the customization, you can again download the, the products as files. And again, this service also is not only available as a web user interface, but it is again also available as an API uh, to, to be automated, to have an automated access. So, you can uh, use uh, and write your own scripts to, to retrieve and uh, customize the data. So AUMDAC is another way of accessing uh, the, the data store products uh, that much easy, in a much easier fashion uh, from command line, you can uh, download any product. So as a conclusion, uh, the next generation of UMESAT satellites will have more data uh, when compared with today's uh, satellite data. So the UMETCAS Africa satellite service will not be able to carry them, carry all of them uh, in full resolution. But the good news is that there are new data services already in place that can be benefited instantly and easily. And the next generation of uh, Puma stations uh, is being planned to be compatible with these new ways of accessing data. But of course, for the, for the pool data services, there needs to be some kind of internet connection in your institute. And for UMETCAS terrestrial, you need to be connected to your uh, NREN in your country. So for any question uh, you may have, please feel free to contact us via our help desk. So this concludes my presentation, but uh, please stay tuned for the next presentation which will be about uh, region, uh, research and education networks over Africa that is uh, also used by UMEDCAS Terrestrial. Thank you. Thank you, Erdem. Merci beaucoup. And I would like to pass the floor now to Youssef. 
So if, uh, yes, thanks Erdem for stopping sharing. Youssef, if you are with us, you can start sharing your screen. We will see it soon. Yes, we see your presentation now. The floor is yours, Youssef. We cannot hear you presently. Maybe you have to unmute your mic. I'm very sorry. I'm, I have been muted. So now I'm, I'm, I'm muted. So let me start by thanking you all. Uh, I'm proud and glad to be with you and happy to be to learn about uh, now casting in Africa is something, something new for me, though I am in touch with the African uh, group on Earth Observation and so on. But now uh, I think it's more focused. So I'm happy to be to be with you. I will be speaking about Af not ASRIN, Africa Connect 3 uh, to enable Earth Observation activities. I will be representing uh, not only ASRIN, uh, but also WACRIN and the Internet Alliance. We are three regional partners in, in Africa. I represent uh, work at the continental level to support uh, the development and services for research and education communities. Let me start by this slide. It's, I cannot advance my slide. What's it? Okay. Uh, very quickly, I, I think I don't have much time to go over all my slides, but in this slide, I want to say that digital infrastructure now is crucial for everything, especially for science cooperation. And this science cooperation, uh, uh, it's managed and organized by uh, the research and education networks. Uh, so we are crucial to achieve the crucial uh, uh, cooperation. Uh, let me start by research and education networks, uh, NRINs, uh, which I will mention many times in during my presentation. NRINs are uh, represent the national research and education networks. They typically, they are typically and mostly uh, in uh, the uh, public organization in general, uh, mostly funded by the governments or the member institutions. Uh, they provide dedicated uh, services, maybe the main focus on connectivity, but they are now working beyond that, which I will mention in the coming slides and so on. Usually we have, actually, let me go to jump to immediately to the next slide, which is uh, demonstrates how these uh, networks work. So if you look at, uh, at the national, at the institutional level, you will see research institutions, universities, and so on. All these uh, research institutions or universities are connected at the national level within uh, what is so-called a national research and education network. And then, so you can see uh, Reno, you can see uh, uh, you can see uh, Garnet, and also uh, ARN, which is the, for the Algeria. So these these region these national research and education networks are connected to the regional ones, like ASRIN for uh, our region, for uh, uh, working for West and Central African region, and Ubuntu Net Alliance for the uh, 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 East and South uh, uh, African countries. I have to say that we, I am presenting this on behalf of Africa Connectivity, as I said. So uh, now let's look at uh, more details about uh, the situation in, uh, in Africa. We have 38 uh, NRINs in Africa. Uh, if you look at ASRIN, ASRIN, by the way, uh, ASRIN stands for the Arab States Research and Education Network. So if we, in general, we represent 22 Arab countries. 10 of them are in Africa and 12 are in Asia. Uh, but for the sake of uh, Africa Connect 3, we represent only four countries, Algeria, Egypt, Morocco, and Tunisia, and um, soon uh, uh, Libya. But the other Arab countries are now uh, covered under uh, uh, the other clusters. So we have Wakren. You can see that in Wakren region, West and Central African region, you'll see you have Burkina Faso, has Enren, uh, Cameroon, Chad, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana. Uh, Ghana mentioned uh, twice, I'm sorry. Uh, Guyana, Mali, Niger, uh, uh, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, and Togo. I'm mention, mentioning these names and one by one because I want to, you to invite you to, to start discussing with them on how you can uh, use make use of this, this network. For Obitunit Alliance, actually, it's the largest region, if you can see on the map, which is the, the, the biggest one. Uh, 
So for the for that we have Burundi, uh, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, Kenya, Madagascar, uh, Malawi, Mozambique, uh, uh, Namibia, Rwanda, Somalia, South Africa, Sudan, Tanzania, Uganda, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. However, not all of these networks are connected. So if you look at uh, uh, maybe uh, this slide comes, uh, which has been shared also by. Uh, by Erdem, it's uh, about the uh, uh, global research and education network. So we are now at Africa, we are part of the global research and education network through the uh, uh, Africa Collect3 project. Now, uh, again, it's uh, like a history where we were and where we are now. So we started in October 2010 with Africa Connect 1, uh, Human Connect, uh, sorry, and then Africa Connect 1, 2, and 3, which is now we are in the third version of, and we, you can see more, more engines are connected now to the European uh, network, JAN. So now this is, I want this slide to, to show you how many of uh, these engines are really connected. The others are not connected, but we are trying to help to connect them through the Africa Connect3 project. So those who are connected, I can see I'm confidently that uh, in the Ubuntu Alliance region, we have Burundi, DRC, Kenya, Malawi, Mozambique, Rwanda, Somalia, South Africa, Tanzania, Uganda, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. We are connected to the Ubuntu Alliance network. And for Ukraine, Ghana, Nigeria, Togo, uh, Benin, Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire are also connected in, uh, in my region, uh, Algeria, Egypt, Morocco, and Tunisia. So now uh, I, it's a message that we have better, uh, more connectivity, but we are working on further to connect more countries, maybe Mali, Ethiopia, and we are trying also with Libya also. So let me just quickly go over Africa Connect 3 and why is it for? It's uh, funded by the European Commission through DG INTPA uh, with uh, 37.5 million euros. Uh, European Commission will, be, will pay 80% of that uh, of that uh, amount, and we are we are responsible to secure the rest of the 20%. We are trying to get them from the beneficiary interns and the universities, but because of the COVID and so on, we have complication in getting. Uh, uh, fund the co-funding. We have a challenge. I'm putting this challenge now in front of you. We are trying to find uh, alternatives and uh, trying to do some advocacy and donor engagement activities to try to find uh, more funding. But however, this slide is not directed to you, but I wanted you to know also that we have challenges also. In general, uh, Africa Connect 3 comes in four contracts. Uh, uh, three of them are with, with the three clusters, with the Internet Alliance, uh, with cluster one, with the cluster two, with Wakrin, and another one with the uh, Asrin. So we have three clusters with the regional uh, players in Africa. And the main contract is with the Giant, which is the European Research and Education Network. We call it a cluster zero because they are handling actually the uh, bulk procurement, uh, interconnectivity, and so on. So we want to, uh, because they have mature system and they, they 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 follow exactly the European Commission rules and procurement and so on. So they they are doing handling the procurement of the and and uh, cloud services and so on. But in general, we are all represent. We all represent the. The project it comes into um, three main, uh, four main out outputs. One of them, the, the first one is to secure ac uh, access to, uh, to the universities and institutions through affordable and adequate infrastructure. Uh, try to improve the infrastructure. The second one is to provide dedicated services like educational roaming, uh, federation of access, and uh, other cloud services, which, which I will come to in another slide. Uh, capacity building in terms of for interns and also for uh, benefic some beneficiaries based on, uh, for example, we we are we can provide capacity building for uh, open science and open access and uh, maybe we can do some workshops dedicated for science communities. Uh, uh, we can discuss that in a separate uh, meeting as well. The fifth, the fourth output, which is always about. Uh, awareness conferences uh, uh, raising awareness and and management and communications 
I'm not going to, to, to the details of the work packages, but I will highlight those of interest to this community. The first work package is about uh, upgrading the connectivity and uh, enhancing the infrastructure with focus on connectivity first, so as I, uh, which I just mentioned. We have upgraded many uh, connected new, new universities. We have, uh, sorry, new entrants. We have also uh, connected, uh, uh, enhanced, and upgraded the, the capacity of other uh, institutions. What, which, which is very important here, we have a budget for cloud-based infrastructure for African open science. So we are we are promoting and uh, trying to help uh, to uh, access mechanisms for research and education communities through cloud infrastructure, which we'll be deploying. And from our ASRIAN region, we have started uh, following the Latin Amer American uh, harvesting infrastructure is called La Francia, where we are trying to bring harvesting infrastructure to our region in ASRIAN uh, to bring access to all uh, open data repositories in, the, in, in our region. Uh, other clusters will follow also the same model, but uh, we are, as we are leading this activity, so we, are, we, we, are, we have started that. We will soon announce our uh, regional harvesting infrastructure. Uh, to make access to uh, open access uh, to me to facilitate access through this platform to the uh, open access repositories in the in our region the other things that are also very important for you which is trust and identity services educational roaming uh, federated identity management for libraries also it's another important thing for you uh, the rest are, I think it's also important, but these I'm trying to highlight only the important uh, uh, parts. Uh, the third work package is about uh, capacity building. Uh, we will be happy to uh, cooperate on, on uh, some workshops to the community to, to introduce uh, with your community, for example, to introduce how they can benefit from uh, research and education networks, how they can connect that, and uh, to, how, how they can connect to uh, based on mutual uh, mutual interest or mutual benefits, and uh, and so on. We can we can. I'm happy to discuss this also with you. Uh, we have also uh, another uh, work package on. Uh, Women empowerment, and we are doing that. We have a few follow up, follow uh, on Africa Connect Three website, Africa Africa Connect Three uh, Facebook uh, and Twitter. You will see a lot of activities related to women empowerment, and uh, I will be happy to 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 facilitate to to facilitate access to these uh, uh, activities. I think this is very the most important uh, uh, work package that is related to you, to you as so there is a dedicated package was called in engagement with user communities. Uh, initially, when we started the project, we thought of, of uh, mainly AfriGU and Jimmy South Africa. We have been in touch with them uh, so that so far, but now we believe that there are. They, uh, okay, let me before going to this to the details of this work package. I just mentioned that the uh, entrants and so on are more, resp more responsible on providing connectivity, providing access, and providing uh, edurome and edu gain. But I've been uh, sending a call that entrants can do more uh, about uh, more to the communities. Rather, uh, it's not about connectivity. They can be facilitator and uh, enabler or convener of, of, of many activities. If you look, I invited our colleagues in the various entrants to look at uh, to do some observation on global trends, priorities, uh, and so on. You will see that, for example, United Nations SDGs is uh, is high priority. Uh, science, uh, which which implies that there 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 is a need for science, education, community engagement towards achieving this United Nations SDGs. So entrants can have a, a stake on that. Science uh, cooperation and science diplomacy, open science and open access, uh, open data, uh, science communities, which is now uh, what I am, why I am addressing you, and communities of practice, scientific computing. Uh, that's why there, there is a need for open science cloud and so on. I, I, I add many other reasons. So this is my call to our entrance to, to, to take care of what's happening now, 
so that uh, they can be engaged in different kind of convention uh, interventions. I mean, they can be a convener, they can be a host for some services, they can be an operator for a, a service provider, secretariat, and, and uh, any kind of interventions. So for this purpose, I think my call was accepted and I was invited to for an interview, which I encourage you to share. It's on uh, and to look at. It's uh, at the giant uh, uh, magazine. It's it is the the marketing and the official uh, marketing uh, magazine of the giant uh, network of Europe. Uh, I will share the link for that uh, for the for the entire magazine, also for my my interview. So I am calling for a new role of entrance to be more in, more engaged and so on. And that's why I said we are here with you. So back to Africa Connect Three and uh, science. Uh, why Africa Connect Three is, is enabling science cooperation? So we mainly in in, in very quick uh, summary, uh, we provide connectivity which is why we are here, why one of the services. We try to provide the mobility services, namely Edurome, if you are familiar with Edurome, which is uh, Wi-Fi, global Wi-Fi uh, uh, roaming, uh, internet roaming, where you can connect to uh, wherever you are. Edugain as another federation access uh, service, uh, uh, the same for EduVPN and so on. Uh, we believe also, we are also uh, through Africa Connect 3, we, are try, we start providing infrastructure, uh, cloud infrastructures as service, services. Uh, we have also an, uh, trying to support open science through uh, LibSense, which is an initiative to bring in uh, librarians together to promote uh, open science and also to encourage uh, national roadmaps and uh, uh, national, when I mean national roadmaps to support the policy level uh, to, to plan for being, to be a part of the open science. If you are aware, uh, open science now is a mandatory mandate by the United Nations. And for that purpose, uh, the UNESCO has produced after one, one year of consultation, uh, produced the, uh, what is so-called uh, UNESCO's recommendation in open science. So they are inviting all entrants, all, all, not entrants, all states, member states, because UNESCO works with member states. They are inviting all member states to uh, uh, achieve, to, to be part of the op global open science. And from our uh, perspective as ASRIN, uh, we are now starting our open science cloud infrastructure uh, uh, in coordination with the European Open Science Cloud, if you are aware of it, it's a huge infrastructure to support and facilitate access to science and research data through this platform and through this cloud. So the, th the fifth uh, uh, is engagement with the research and education communities, which is why we are here now. So far, we have identified AFRIG, which is the African Group on Earth Observation. I think some of you are member of Africa, uh, AFRIG. GMIS and Africa, and I'm sure that many of you are involved also in uh, GMIS and Africa. African uh, European Radio Astronomy Partnership, Digital Earth Africa, uh, African Strategy on Fundamental and Applied Physics, African Light Source uh, Community, which is a very good uh, and new uh, community and works on light source and synchrotrons. We are now trying to identify communities on climate actions, which is uh, also we are taking uh, good progress in terms of being be part of the COP26. And we, we have been part of COP26, and we will be contributing to COP27 on uh, endurance and uh, to support the climate actions. So we are trying to get more engaged in communities to understand and so on. For this purpose, uh, we are uh, doing several activities. One of them is conferences and workshops, and we are happy to. We are we are part of we are, we are now happy to be part of your workshop, and we will invite you also to our workshops and conferences. We work on capacity building also. Uh, the most important part is this. We are trying to uh, uh, identify the needs of research and education communities and science communities in terms of connectivity, access mechanisms, uh, data dissemination, and other services through a survey that we will be sending out in June, around June actually, 
uh, to be shared with all communities that, that I just mentioned and any other um, community that we, community that we identify, so that we uh, we will ask questions on uh, what do they need and what are the requirements, uh, their challenges, uh, and we will use this uh, outcome, the outcome of this survey as a call for support to these communities, uh, to the mainly to, to the European Commission, and we'll take it to the African Union uh, Commission to see how we can uh, satisfy the needs of these communities. I know maybe, maybe we can read some of these needs, like uh, access, uh, bandwidth, uh, cloud, uh, maybe HPC, maybe. So we want to identify all the need, these needs so to try to uh, support these communities through another call or another project. There is a good potential, especially if you look at the recent announcement of the European Commission, the Digital Gateway and the Digital Hub for D4D Hub and so on. There are lots of opportunities in DCI also uh, that we, we will take the outcome, the outcome of this survey to the donors and to, uh, to try to facilitate and uh, enable uh, and support, achieve, let's say, satisfy the needs of these communities. I'm sorry I'm going too long, but uh, I, I'm about, about, about to finish. So maybe also uh, we will also, we are, like what you are doing now again, we are promoting the deployment of services and access mechanisms. We are promoting open science and open data and open science platforms, uh, also supporting women empowerment and, and so on. I, before I conclude, I install this, I install this uh, uh, slide uh, from uh, Visa, uh, Nitsu Vara, I'm sorry for, for, if, if I could not spell the name right. I, I like this, it's vital for African user community to be uh, to be an active partner in this development. So I invite you also, I, con I, I commend and second on this, uh, uh, call. So we are also happy here here to facilitate and cooperate with you. So my call here to, to you, I invite you also to to, to start coordinating with your local entrants and explore uh, if your university institution is already connected. And if not, um, you can negotiate on how you can connect. I invite you also in a way or another, I'm in discussion with uh, Vincent and also with uh, Erdem to see what are the your requirements uh, to, uh, or the requirements of requirements of user to be able to receive the, uh, I said now, now, now cast. Uh, uh, the, the, the other thing I invite you to participate in the survey, uh, we will publish around June and I, through our colleagues uh, here, we will, we will share it with you. I invite you also to join our conferences because we want also to know about you and uh, we we also need you to know about us. So we have uh, conferences. Ubuntu Alliance conference always is always in uh, in November. Our conference is always in December, but we have very 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 close one is Wakren conference. It's in. Uh, it's in uh, end of April, so I will. They are not. They did not announce the program yet, but I will share the program with you. I invite you not only to participate, but but, but to speak. For so for my ASLIN conference, I will facilitate a slot for you to speak about uh, what you have just presented today, and you you may contact me for further discussion. I'm happy to, to do that. And thank you. I'm sorry for being long. Thank you, Youssef. No problem. And I think it was very, very uh, uh, interesting presentation and very pertinent for for the for this uh, this this webinar. Uh, indeed, data access and, and uh, scientific cooperation, as we have seen with SWIFT, is, is quite a key tool uh, in the Europe uh, Africa cooperation. I just would like, in complement, because today we have been discussing about of lots of no casting. But uh, we had a webinar last year on uh, use of satellite data for climate services. And there is an EU-funded project also called CLIMSA, uh, which promotes the, the, the climate services in Africa with some, actually, it's also the MET services and the regional climate centers. Some of them have been presenting today are also fully involved. So I think in terms of user engagement uh, for um, the climate activities, 
uh, it's it's really fall into this um, this this uh, topic, and obviously no casting with climate change uh, increasing the the number of extreme events and uh, their their uh, severity also in Africa. Um, no casting is a tool to uh, to prevent and to follow up uh, severe events. So I think I'm, I'm looking forward for our further discussion in in uh, engaging with these uh, communities and see how we can best serve, serve it. So thank you for your presentation. I would like also just to take, uh, before we jump to the last presentation, um, two minutes to answer some of live for some of the questions. So actually, uh, Youssef, there is two questions for you. One from Morocco, from Hel Madi Hel Kalki. So I am from Morocco. How can I join the as as Ren, as a researcher. Maybe you can... Uh, ah, yes, I saw that you, you answered already. <laughs> Do you want to answer live, just for the old... Yeah, for, for, for everyone, actually. I, I, I would be happy. I will write my, my, my email in the chat. Uh, happy to be in touch with all of you. Uh, for Morocco, actually... Uh, Usually, we don't work directly with uh, institutions because there is a hierarchy that I just mentioned, the regional network, national network. So usually, we don't interfere with the work of the national NREN. Uh, but by all means, we will be happy to cooperate and facilitate uh, this cooperation. So uh, I, I will be happy to discuss the, the, the details with him uh, via email. I al already shared my email with him. And for... Uh, uh, Koibia, Koibia, Koiba, yeah. Koiba, yeah. So uh, the conditions to become Africa Connect Three member again, Africa Connect Three member, it has only, it has only, it's it's a, it's a contract actually with the European Commission with with four contractors. So to be beneficiary from the, the from the project, you have to be in uh, NREN, National Research and Education Network, that with which we work directly. In case there is no end in that country, then we can discuss make how we can cooperate. So in general, you cannot become a member because it's not a membership uh, project. It's a project to facilitate infrastructure and services through uh, the various uh, work packages that I've just mentioned. So to make to make use of this uh, Africa Connect 3, you have to be part of uh national uh, research and education network and you can benefit benefit from these services either in, through capacity building through attending conferences through engaged with the science communities uh, and, and so on uh, but in case th there is no internet at your country uh, we, you may con contact for example if you are, if you belong you reach your country belongs to wakren region then you need to contact wakren and uh, uh, and in case you need to, uh, in my region, please contact me. Otherwise, contact uh, Ubuntu, Ubuntu Net Alliance uh, for, for further uh, either engagement. And if you want to see how you can benefit and how you can, uh, maybe we can work together to support the development of Indian in your country and so on. We, we will try to find the mechanism for cooperation with, uh, with uh, non Indian countries also. Okay, this is very good to hear, uh, Youssef, that there will be some possibilities also if an institution is not in a country which has an NREN, we could still investigate to see how they could get uh, connected. Huh? I've seen yes. there is indeed yes. still several countries missing in the, in, the, in the map. I know you are working hard to get them involved, but that, that's a good, a good uh, news and message. There was a, a last question. This was more for um, Erdem about uh, the will MTG product be integrated in Puma as they were with MSG? I don't know if Erdem, would you would like to answer to that one? Yes, Vincent, um, good question actually. Um, of course, the, the next generation of Puma satellites are planned to be compatible with um, the baseline of uh, UMEDCAST Africa but uh, it is also planned to make them compatible with more data or let's say the full data uh, from MTG that could be available to do UMEDCAS terrestrial or uh, via UMEDVIEW uh, um, or data store. So uh, they will be compatible with most of the MTG data and products, 
uh, but to uh, utilize the, the, the final connection or uh, having the proper connection will be dependent, dependent on the country by country. Thank you, Erdem. I would like also just to inform that uh, under the CLIMSA project, the African Union Commission uh, is currently preparing a procurement for the next generation of the Puma station. And the current plan is that uh, the Puma station will still be based on Numetka satellites. And that indeed, uh, the plan, current plan is that to have this contract awarded by the end of this year, beginning of next year, to have the deployment of the new Puma station in 23-324. Here also, I would like to refer to a webinar we have organized last year on MTG. Uh, the link are still available. We can distribute that where there were some description of this procurement process. And obviously, we'll come back on data access. This is a, a topic uh, that will be uh, highly relevant, and we will address this again during the UMETSAT User Forum in Africa. Uh, that will take place uh, virtually on 8 and 9 of June and physically in Tanzania between 13 and 16 of September 2022. So this will be a good opportunity uh, to continue this dialogue um, on, on how to best access the satellite data for your application in Africa and how to get engaged also with uh, ASREN and with uh, the Africa Connect 3 and the, and the NRN. I would like now to pass the floor to André again for the last presentation of today before we conclude. So André uh, did the, the, the opening presentation about the benefit of no casting. And during this presentation, he will uh, share with us his vision of no casting like it could be in uh, almost 10 years from, from now. So André, if you are still with us, you can start sharing your screen. Can you see the we screen? can see your screen, yes. For the moment, it's not in a full, yes, no, it's in full screen mode. So thank you, André, the floor is yours. Okay, good. So uh, this uh, presentation is ju just to share with you our, our thought following our involvement in, in the SWIFT project that you have heard about earlier. And uh, also AMSAF and other initiatives around uh, which uh, usually contribute to actually uh, highlighting and uh, uh, discussing the major uh, challenges that Africa has and how we move forward. So we'll first start with uh, what are the facts in terms of uh, now casting across Africa, and then um, uh, a short statement on the vision for now casting in 2030. And then uh, one or two slides on how we see actually bringing this vision about uh, using uh, the opportunities that uh, most of us highlighted uh, uh, during this day. Uh, so uh, on the facts, uh, uh, until now, very few uh, med services in Africa are exploiting the potentials that we see in the non-casting SAF products. Uh, and this has been, is avail has been uh, available for more than a decade now. Uh, and uh, Africa is still uh, behind in terms of uh, capitalizing on the potential of these products that we saw during the day. Uh, secondly, uh, on the high resolution models, as you, you heard, uh, to run the SAF now casting, you need uh, model data in addition to satellite and uh, in situ data. Uh, so a high resolution uh, model output are not yet uh, regular in Africa. And uh, we have the, uh, a strong effort to be made uh, in Africa using the, the processing capacity that is improving in the continent uh, to work together and have uh, such input data that goes into non-casting available. Uh, also, uh, the potential in satellite products to support directly the, the sectors, health, DRR, food security, uh, even trading in commodity markets, uh, public infrastructure uh, and transport, 
are yet to be tapped into because of little effort on satellite data, uh, sector data, and actionable in indices validated. Uh, so the idea here is to raise the, uh, the challenge we have to actually uh, taking our satellite data, uh, uh, processing it with the impact data, and then building uh, actionable indicators that uh, are needed for, for our decisions. Uh, on the uh, other hand, we have uh, specific processes and phenomena uh, over Africa. The African monsoon, for example, have its uh, specificities that we should uh, understand better and improve knowledge on to actually be able uh, to focus and uh, identify our thresholds values for, for impacts. Uh, and to, to do this effectively, we'll need to use a higher resolution satellite as well as model data available. And uh, so having said that specific competencies are needed uh, to actually process this data and uh, capacity building for Africa specifically should uh, focus on those uh, competencies that are known to be uh, essential for us to, to capitalize on and add value on the products that may be available globally. Uh, so the vision is for a disaster resilient Africa with a network of modern impact-based now casting system development. We emphasize on local development because mm -hmm. with the, the now casting products, we are able to go at the kilometer scale. And that's effectively where and in our rural community specifically, we'll need uh, to actually bring information. Uh, so how do we bring this vision about? Uh, uh, as uh, all of us knows, uh, at the global level, through the UNFCCC, there are opportunities on uh, uh, improving facilities to improve observing systems, uh, which are looking at climate, but definitely it will impact our, uh, our activities and our effort on, on, on non-casting timescales. Uh, so uh, over Africa, the first uh, on item on observations is actually to rehabilitate the, the synoptic stations that we have at country level. Uh, and also uh, local in situ observation stations of the national observing networks. Uh, these are essential to help us uh, tailor uh, products and validate it at the local scale, particularly. The second priority uh, is um, uh, high speed internet and high performance computing systems uh, that will be needed to run uh, for example, SAF now casting at the continental scale, because for, for some high tech uh, domains, it is becoming more and more clearer that uh, integrating our efforts uh, and using optimally regional centers will help to generate products uh, that can be used by, by a higher number of countries, given the fact that uh, many countries may not be able uh, to even have access to uh, stable energy supply uh, to, to run those systems in real time. Uh, on the scientific aspect, what we are seeing ahead is really uh, having in Africa a scientific and operational network well vested into uh, modern data assimilation systems for satellite data knowing that we may not be able to actually populate uh, the continent with uh, a lot of ground stations. Assimilating satellite data is here a, a, a strategic priority in terms of research uh, and also operations uh, to better undertake non casting activities. Uh, then we'll build this around uh, visits, scientific visits, uh, from developed countries to Africa or from Africa to developed countries, workshops, uh, seminars. And I should say that uh, a SWIFT project has shown us how to do this effectively. 
and uh, put together uh, experts from uh, developed countries and Africa together and uh, generate uh, what is needed, co-produce and co-develop uh, what is necessary. Uh, the other priority is on the, how we engage the users, as we know, until we are able to, uh, to demonstrate, to show cases how non-casting product can help to, to better manage our dams or better uh, protect our infrastructure, bridges, and so on. It will not be easy to ensure sustainability. So we put as a, let's say, a clear axis of intervention to ensure sustainability, to actually strengthen user engagement. And here also, uh, the, the examples, the good practices that we learn from SWIFT should be, should be capitalized upon. Uh, now on implementing these, let's say, priorities, uh, what are the, who are the partners on which uh, we should rely? Uh, first of all, for, for coordination and uh, putting together uh, experts uh, from developed and developing countries to transfer modern tools and methods. We have the World Meteorological Organization and uh, regional specialized meteorological centers on now casting. Uh, here I'm thinking of uh, such centers even outside Africa who can be, bring methods, tools, and even products that we may need then to validate uh, in our region and countries. Uh, the second aspect is now on the data exchange to ensure that because we'll need to uh, real time or near real time information is to rely and develop the WMO information system across Africa, building the data collection and production centers around the RCCs and then uh, strengthening national centers to access the, the uh, data and exchange uh, products they generate from this data. Then uh, on the research aspect, uh, which should be, uh, as we learn from SWIFT again, which should be research to operations and operations to research interactions, uh, we have uh, to expand the, the little network that SWIFT built uh, to make sure that uh, in more than half of African countries by 2030, we have clear connections, formal relationships between universities and national meteorological centers uh, across the continent. Uh, on the user side, uh, which is really needed to support, uh, to ensure sustainability, we here have uh, uh, UN OSHA, UN DRR, UN Water, WSO, uh, River Basins in Africa, and then the UNDP, who are partners, UNDP, for example, has teamed up with WMO under the Systematic Observation Financing Facility Program. And uh, uh, there it is investment in observing systems, but given UNDP's role in, in development, planning, and implementation, we see it as, a, as another important body we should network at the national level with the med services in, uh, in programs uh, to, to support the use of non-casting services will be developing. So those are the, the idea that uh, we put forward uh, actually to try to put together all the contributions, the valuable contributions we have seen since this morning uh, to then build forward uh, for a future uh, where uh, re resilience for disaster in Africa is improved uh, based on modern non-casting services. Thank you. Thank you, uh, André. Uh, thanks a lot. Merci beaucoup pour cette uh, dernière présentation uh, qui uh, donne uh, un, une vue d'ensemble sur le, le chemin à parcourir uh, pour uh, arriver à... Uh, une situation meilleure, je dirais, pour le euh, nos castings euh, en, en Afrique. Euh, D'ailleurs, sur ce chemin à suivre, je vous, euh, voudrais simplement partager déjà l'information que le 15e Forum des usagers de Metsat en Afrique se tiendra du 13 au 16 septembre 2022 
Ici aussi, les invitations vont bientôt être lancées. Euh, un pré-programme a été déjà conçu euh, et comme je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, inclura aussi euh, une session sur euh, tout ce qui est prévision, nos castings et prévision euh, du, de, de la météorologique basée sur les données satellitaires. Et il y aura également une, une session sur l'accès aux données, euh, donc deux des, des, des sujets dont, dont nous avons discuté euh, aujourd'hui. Il y aura aussi une session réservée pour les services météo en ligne du 8 au 9 juin qui permettra notamment de mieux préparer les sessions de septembre en Tanzanie. Um, today was a long day. Uh, I would like to thank everybody, but before I would like to pass the floor, um, first to I see that Youssef would like to add something. So Youssef, I will pass you the floor. Please go yes, ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, again, I, I, I'm happy for this opportunity and I hope we can really contribute. But I suggest for the partners that you, you have just mentioned in uh, the slides, I would in, I would encourage you to put Endrins and um, as, as partners or whatever model you want to, to get them engaged because uh, our call to uh, our community to our to the donors and so on that we are coming not only for connectivity but also for applications and for services and so on and that's why we have uh, for example in, uh, added a work package dedicated for engagement with science communities in africa connect 3 there was no such kind of engagement so it's maybe it's uh, just another step towards being more involved with with, with your needs and so on so i suggest that if you can add uh, this to the partners and there is to be with you in, uh, in the next vision actions and so on it could it, we could help yes that's well noted thank you uh, Youssef. thank you thanks i would like now to pass the floor for uh, to duke uh, project coordinator of, of swift for some uh, concluding uh, remarks so duke and, and a wrap up of the day so, so thank you, Vasa. Um, so I, I started with remarks at the beginning of the, uh, the meeting this morning. Uh, uh, thank you to UMET SAT for inviting the SWIFT project to partner in this, uh, this webinar. Uh, I think it's been a remarkable day and I've been very inspired by uh, the presentations that I have seen. Uh, there are a number of things which are inspiring. I, I think in particular the the, the strong partnerships which are clear um, across the continent and the opportunities to make those partnerships stronger. Uh, the SWIFT project is ending this month after four and a half years. And we started from the beginning knowing that, you know, a project always uh, has a, an end date, but by working in partnership with the agencies and uh, the organizations who have a long-term mandate is how the, the, our work has a legacy. Um, so uh, these partnerships with UMETSAT, with WMO and with the weather services in Africa and with the academic uh, services, the academic organizations are, are vital. Um, and and this, this idea of partnership has been emphasized uh, throughout the day. And it's clear that the now casting enterprise and the value chain uh, depends on a number of actors in Africa and in Europe. Uh, and around the world, um, and, and all of these agencies have a, a role to play. Uh, I personally believe that the academic and research uh, angle and the cooperation between universities and research institutions with the operational services is the way that now casting will become independent in Africa and, and realize that this vision um, but also it's clear that the international cooperation is needed. And I was particularly inspired by the, the, the last presentation from the director uh, of ACMAD, Andre Kamga, uh, with his vision of a disaster re resilient Africa, um, where now casting is, is in place, where the partnerships between academia and operations are, are active in, in at least half of African countries. Uh, and where co-production with the, the users of, of the services is widespread. Um, and I think we can achieve these aims. I think there is, you know, the, the, we, the world has changed over the last 10 years and we have the opportunity now with the, the tools available now for now casting 
in Africa and with the opportunities of the new satellite, which are remarkable opportunities. Um, uh, we should look in 2030, we should look at the situation and see that the world has changed. So it's been an inspiring day and I look forward to the work that we will do together in the coming years. And again, thank you to Ibetsat for, for inviting us to, uh, to cooperate on this meeting. Thank you, Doug. Thanks to you, to, uh, to SWIFT and uh, all your partners uh, in Europe and in Africa who have uh, indeed also contributed enormously to, this, uh, to, to the success of, of, of today. Um, I would like to thank uh, all uh, presenters uh, for uh, the time they have taken to prepare the presentation and deliver it to you. Uh, thanks also to the interpreters for the hard job of uh, translating mainly from English to French actually today. And uh, also to my colleagues uh, here who have supported uh, the uh, operation of this webinar on, on the logistic uh, um, aspects. Uh, to conclude, I would like to, to get back to what my Director General said at the beginning of today. I mean, UMETSAT remains very much committed to uh, cooperate with Africa. Our member states, or 30 member states, have adopted a new UMETSAT strategy, uh, which is called Horizon 2030, uh, in uh, June last year. South Africa has an important place in this strategy. We are really committed to ensure access to our satellite data, but also training. Uh, and capacity building also. We have been doing that with the European Union and DG INPA since many years, since uh, the early 2000s. And we hope that we will uh, be able also to continue this cooperation with uh, development agencies and uh, in partnership, obviously, with uh, the African uh, communities to uh, further increase the cooperations, but also to ensure that uh, capacities will be there in Africa to uh, get access to the data, to process, create added value services, and support the sustainable development on uh, the continent. So thanks a lot to everybody. Uh, as it was said in the chat, all presentations are available for download. Uh, there will be also a video recording of this webinar, which will be made available. And we will also send to you by um, email a link to a survey uh, to, for you to give us your feedback on uh, this uh, webinar. So thanks a lot to everybody and uh, see you uh, soon for the, at the 15th UMED Status of Forum or to uh, one of our next webinar. Thanks a lot and have a nice end of the day. Thank you. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.